this evening by Mike Miller, City Montpelier Planning Director. Thanks for being here, Mike. Um, and then we are assisted, as always, by Tammy Furry, who is our recording secretary, who makes these meetings into minutes, which we greatly appreciate. Um, so um, what I will do next is turn to Mike, who will give a brief overview of the procedures that can be followed for anyone who might be watching on ORCA but wanting to zoom in with us here. All right. The this real quick. So um, due to this, the state of emergency declared by Governor Scott as a result of COVID-19, as, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and pursuant to addendum six of the executive order, the development review board is authorized to meet electronically. In accordance with Act 92, there is no physical location to observe and listen to this meeting contemporaneously. Um, for public access, however, in accordance with temporary amendments to open meeting law, the Development Review Board is providing public access to the meeting by hosting a video conference meeting, including both video and telephone access options with additional access offered through live streaming of the meeting. And that is what's coming through on ORCA. We are using the Zoom meeting platform for this remote meeting. All members of the Development Review Board have the ability to communicate at the same time with this meeting through this platform and the public has access to listen and if desired participate in this meeting in real time by either joining the meeting at this address here which is available on the city's website as well if you go to um, this location down here on montpelier-vt.org you can go to our calendar and find this meeting and click on the link, or you can call into the meeting at this number. And with either option, the meeting ID and the password is right here. And I'll leave this up for a few minutes if anyone wants to participate. So we gave notice of the pub to the public of the necessary information for accessing this meeting, including how to access the meeting using telephone or video, and it is posted in the meeting agenda. And instructions have been provided on the city website, as we mentioned at that site. If you have problems getting access to this meeting, you can uh, email me, Michael Miller, at mmiller at montpelier-vt.org. Further, if you have difficulties while accessing video conferencing um, in the Zoom platform, you can also message me through the chat function, uh, which is at the bottom. When you have logged into the meeting, you should um, you should have an opportunity to tell the moderate, which, moderator which applications you wish to comment on, and you can send that via the chat function to me. When the chair announces that the time for public comment for your application arrives, the moderator will unmute members of the public based on the order you submitted your intent. If you are interested in speaking and did not say you would like to speak previously, please raise your hand or state your name if you're unmuted and city staff will add you to the queue. Once the chair has recognized you to participate, the moderator will unmute your microphone and confirm that you can be heard and you are then free to provide your questions or comments, aiming to keep them to two minutes. The members will have opportunities to respond or ask questions of you and the applicant may have an, app, an opportunity to respond. The chair may grant additional time for speakers who have follow-up questions or comments. If you have finished, your microphone will be muted again. The chair will then call on the next person to speak. You will be able to provide additional input, but only after the chair recognizes you again. If no one requests to provide additional information, the chair will move on. Uh, continuing the, move, the meeting if necessary. In the event the public is unable to access this meeting, uh, this meeting will be continued to a date and time certain. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting will be done um, by roll call, and I'll now hand the meeting back over to the chair. Great. Thank you, Mike, for that overview. I appreciate it. Um, all right. So what we will do next is approval of the agenda, um, which we'll do by roll call. Are there any um, modifications to the agenda from DRB members? 
Okay, in that case, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Motion by Kevin. Second. Seconded by Joe. Seconded by Joe. Thank you, Joe. And now I'll call the roll. Um, Joe. Yes. Bob. Yes. Roger. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Michael. Yes. And then Kate, I vote yes as well. So we have an agenda. Thank you. Um, comments from the chair. Just um, uh, Mike gave us an overview of, of how things will go, but um, I just want to just kind of reiterate the flow that we're generally going to take with each application. The applicant will present um, their application and then have a chance for the board. Then there will be a chance for the board to ask questions. Um, people who, may, who wish to comment may then present and also be asked questions by the board. The applicant will have a chance to respond. Um, we don't do cross-examination in this setting, so um, just a reminder that any questions or concerns do need to be addressed through the chair. Um, and that's those are the comments from the chair. So um, the next item on the agenda, I believe, looking at my agenda, on an iPad here, that's why I'm looking down, yes, is um, to review the meeting minutes of July 6th. Are there any um, modifications or changes, which are the same thing, to the um, minutes as presented in our packet? All right, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Motion by Rob. Second. Second by Roger. All right. Um, all those in favor, Joe? Yes. Or Rob? Yes. Roger? Yes. Kevin? I wasn't at that meeting, Kate. Okay, thank you for reminding me. And Michael? Yes, yeah, same. I wasn't there either. You were not at the meeting. On I was June, not the on, last meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you for confirming that. I will vote yes. That gives us four voting in favor of adopting the minutes, which is enough to pass. Thank you for adopting the minutes. All right, so now we'll turn to the the business of the evening. And the first application is in for North Branch Park on Cummings Street. We're going to hear from the Montpelier Area Mountain Bike Association about a bicycle pump track. And for starters, what I would like to do is swear in anyone who's here to be heard on this matter. So um, what I would like to do is, is know who those people are. If you could um, either pipe up or raise your hand if you're going to be heard on the pump track application. So I see Paige, I see John, Paige Burton, John Holler. Um, folks on the phone, uh, are Ned or John hoping to um, Test to present testimony on this application. Yes, yes please. John, Jose, I would appreciate the opportunity to. Okay, great. So we will swear in both John, Jose, and Ned Swanberg. All right, please raise your right hand. Thank you. Um, swearing in the witnesses. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony Hello, can I speak? Um, yes, who's this? Hi, uh, I'm also on the phone. Um, oh, thank you. I my, didn't see your name. What's your name, please? My name is David, and the last name is spelled P-R-Z-E-P-I-O-S-K-I. -E -E Great. We will include you as well um, to be heard thank on this application. You. Thank you for chiming in. Um, so, for folks who are going to be heard, please raise your right hand, and I'll administer the oath. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Thank you. I do. All right. Thank you all. We have sworn in the witnesses. So what we'll do first is we'll hear a brief summary of the project from Mike Miller, and then we'll turn it over to the applicant. So Mike, if you would, if you would be so kind. All right. Well, um, because as as some of you as Probably most of you know, uh, Meredith is usually the one who does all these applications, worked with the applicant, prepared all of the pieces of this, and came down sick. And so I am covering for her 
And so I don't know what's going to be the best way of actually going through and doing the presentation because I'm not as familiar with this application as perhaps the applicants are. And okay. maybe so that could, might be a better could, path to take. Sounds fine. I, I just put you on the spot, Mike, without any warning. So thank you for reminding us that Meredith's been doing most of the work on this. I'm also comfortable um, with getting an overview from the applicant. So with that, we'll turn it over to you, John. Um, if you would, wouldn't mind taking about um, no more than 10 minutes to tell us, tell us about the project. Sure, happy to do that. Thank you, Kate, and thank you all for serving on the board. This is my first time to appear before the DRB. First night meeting in a while, but appreciate all that you all do for the city. Um, so I'm here on behalf of the Montpelier Area Mountain Bike Association to present this proposal for a pump track. I'm not going to go into great detail because you have that <clears throat> before you in the application as well as the very thorough staff review. So I'm going to assume you've looked at that, read that, um, and I've looked at that. Happy to respond to any questions you have about the project or the comments that are made by the staff. Um, but just briefly, a pump track is, um, is a, a small uh, surface with sort of rolling hills. You, you may have seen the, the Times Argus over the weekend had a picture of the Waterbury pump track. There are probably a dozen around Vermont. They're very popular with kids, uh, young children, teenagers. Some adults use them, but not as, as, it's not as common. They're mostly for kids. Um, and it's a great, you think, a great recreational opportunity for kids. A Mamba, the Montpelier Area Mountain Bike Association, has been looking for a site, thinking about proposing a, a pump track in Montpelier for several years, maybe five years, and <clears throat> have been looking for a long time. Uh, we, when we began work on the North Branch Trail project a few years ago, the, uh, the trail builder who was helping us with that project uh, pointed out this site, and actually I think it was also working with Alec uh, Ellsworth from the Parks Commission, who was not a director then, but was a staff member uh, also. Uh, we had discussions with him about that site, and it really became clear that that was a pretty ideal location. And we've, we've looked at a lot of different sites. It's for many, and obviously not relevant here, but very difficult to find an appropriate location for lots of reasons. We think this one's really ideal for a lot of reasons. <clears throat> One is its proximity to the North Branch Trails, very popular mountain bike uh, trails that the city has uh, helped support, mostly privately funded, um, but enormous popularity of those trails that we're seeing grow every year. This is a nice adjunct to that for kids to be able to explore mountain biking. Those trails are is difficult for uh, kids who are you know, probably younger, ch younger children for sure. Um, it is in close proximity to the swimming pool, the recreational fields, just a short you know, few hundred yards across the bridge, across the north branch and down an existing trail to access them. Um, it's also located adjacent to the Cumming Street Apartments. I think it's gonna be an enormous uh, at, uh, addition for those residents. If you've spent any time over there, you know that those kids love to bike. There are bikes everywhere, and there are always kids on bikes. Um, Kevin, are you having trouble? I sometimes have trouble with my mic, it, it, so I want to make the, sure the, I'm... The sound is dropping off a bit. Uh, OK, I'll try um, to speak so, up. I know my yeah, that would be great. Thank computer's you. never uh, as often the audio is Right, great. it's a compromise. OK, uh, no, and it's my system, too. It's not great. So just let me know if I'm not being loud or whatever. I'll make adjustments. Um, biking is very popular in that neighborhood. Kids are on their bikes all the time. We think this would provide a, a really tremendous recreational opportunity for the kids who live in that area. So uh, it's a flat area. I don't know what it's been used for. Tony Fakos told me that it was at one point used to store materials for the reconstruction of Route 14. I, I'm at Route 12. I don't know whether that was the case or not, but it's a uh, it's not used now, uh, you know, it's a relatively flat surface. Um, we think we've done a lot of due diligence, worked with the state, the wetlands office there to uh, get their sign off on it with the uh, city planning department staff as well. Uh, we think this is a really good project. It's, we've raised uh, about $8,500, most of that through private fundraising uh, to build this, uh, this site. Short distance, about a mile from the center of downtown Montpelier, so easily accessible by a bicycle. So we think it's going to be really popular, great addition for recreational opportunities in Montpelier. Okay, great. Thank you, John. Um, so 
I'm trying to think, we have, we have several people here to be heard on this, and often at this point we would let those folks speak. I think what I would like to do is go through some of the items highlighted in the staff report as needing some discussion and to give the applicant a chance to speak to those in okay. more detail um, and then work in some of the, um, the, the comments as we go. Rob, yes. Yes, uh, I just would like to say that I'm an avid non-biker and a member of the Vermont Non-Bike Association. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's a conflict, but I would like to disclose it and uh, but I can be fair uh, in uh, you know reviewing this application. So Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's a good reminder. Are there any other um, members of the DRB who have anything to disclose or visited the site or um, anything anything else that might be relevant to our discussion? Nobody else has anything to disclose. Previous work on this on this project. Okay, um, so maybe what I, maybe what I'd like to do is just just so I know how to manage the flow of this. I would like I'm going to go through each of the people who have said that they're interested in chiming in, and I, I'm going to get a sense of what issue you're going to chime in on because we may be able to do this um, in the in the middle of the staff review. So I'm just going to go in the order you introduced yourself. So um, Paige. Which um, parts of the application would you like to comment on? If you wouldn't mind just unmuting their page so we can hear you, that's okay. I'm uh, concerned about, about the vernal pool on the other side of Cumming Street and the wetlands, which turns out to be a beaver pond adjacent to the site, and just making sure those are protected. Okay, thank you. And, um, and John, uh, John, John Jose. Uh, yeah, my uh, concerns are similar uh, to Paige's, um, more specific to um, some of the uh, amphibian breeding and migration uh, that takes place uh, in the area of the wetlands and in the proposed project area. Thank you. And Ned? I have five things I would speak to, uh, or at least four. Um, one of which is again, you know, the vernal pool and the wetland features, um, and their use by wildlife, um, and the lack of any kind of space or buffer planting. Um, I'd also like to speak to the fact that it's an overlapping hazard area with floodplain issues and river corridor issues. Make sure we're clear about what that's all about. Um, it also relates in part to the uh, CRS program, but that's kind of a, a sidebar, but it might be of interest. Um, and I'm also very interested in whether this responds to the actual uh, social and recreational needs of the people in the adjacent apartments or whether this is coming in kind of separate from anything that's been identified by that community. And the okay, thank you. Oh, park, parking net, is that what you said? Yes, that's right. Okay, okay, thanks. And then um, David. Hello everyone, uh, my name is David, um, and so to echo every, what everyone else just said, I'm also very concerned about the, um, the wetlands and the vernal pool. I don't like the idea of uh, putting up a buffer or a fence. Um, you, um, you can't segment uh, nature, it just, you'll destroy it. Um, also, um, I, I happen to live on Cumming Street, and I don't know if uh, anyone else does, but uh, it's a real joy to uh, hear in the spring all the spring peepers, and it's uh, it's really beautiful. Um, and that's just one aspect of uh, the beauty of this area uh, on Cumming Street is uh, how integrated uh, nature is into um, um, the, uh, you know, the apartments and the houses that are already here, and I don't want to um, destroy that. Uh, there's there's all kinds of animals and wildlife, and I can go on and on and on about its beauty. Um, the other thing is uh, I'm very concerned um, uh, as, a, as a cyclist uh, uh, for a lot of years. Um, I, I know that uh, there's a lot of fads. Uh, you know, it's, you know, the mountain bikers are calling it a pump track, but uh, BMX is called it a, um, 
um, uh, I don't know, just a dirt racing track uh, some years ago. Mm-hmm. And they're just fads. And so I, I fear that um, what um, they want, so a few people want now um, is just a small uh, segment of the population. And uh, they're just going to lose interest in it. And I don't like the idea of the, uh, the 10 parking spaces um, or the extra traffic on this road. Um, okay, thanks. So you know, there's, um, there's traffic. Okay, so as, as we go through each of those items, I will invite people to speak. I thought that might be a little um, cleaner than bouncing than having people speak before the before we've heard some of the details on those various issues. So I'm, I'm going to give that a try. Thank you for bearing with me. It's a little funky on Zoom compared to in person, but we will do our best. So um, the way that I like to do this is to go through the staff report, which hopefully folks have. Um, A lot of the things, and then we'll talk about the things that are outstanding. So the issues that I've identified as outstanding based on the staff report, um, we should talk a little bit about the use determination, what its actual use is, as well as um, whether we, we should decide as a board whether we believe the impervious surface is being created. Um, and then wetlands and vernal pools, parking, and landscaping. And for each of these, um, I will ask the applicant to provide uh, information. I'll ask the board to ask questions. Um, I would ask that people here to be heard on the matter, please wait to be invited to speak um, rather than jumping in. Okay? We'll just do our best to manage it. So let's start with the use determination. So um, the staff recommendation is that this is um, a considered a nature and recreational parks use. That use is defined as a site designed to accommodate primarily passive recreation or appreciation or nature with a minimum of improvements or structures. Passive recreation is generally defined as recreational activities that do not require prepared facilities like sports fields or pavilions and can provide communities with opportunities like camping, trail running, and cross-country skiing. Um, The staff recommendation is that it is such a use and that even if we do not agree with that determination, it is materially similar to those uses. So I'd like to turn to my fellow board members and see um, if if folks agree with that determination. I do. I do agree with that, uh, Kate. Okay. Seeing some thumbs up um from rob and kevin uh any questions or concerns from other board members roger's okay um this is joe so if i'm reading this correctly the the staff's determination is that it is a passive recreation area mm-hmm. that's right but so I, I feel like that flies in conflict with part two here generally defined as a recreational activities that do not require prepared facilities like sports field or pavilion. I, I know this isn't a sports field or a pavilion, but it's a track that you're going to be building. So I disagree with the staff's recommendation. Okay. If, um, Joe, what do you think about the further suggest staff suggestion that this is considered materially similar? which is defined at the bottom of page four, um, that it should be allowed to the same extent and subject to the same standards if it has similar impact to the neighborhood, such as traffic, noise, and lighting, similar characteristics, such as building type, site arrangement, floor area, number of employees, other things that aren't really relevant. Um, could you see this as being materially similar? Yeah, I can agree with that. I don't think that mm-hmm. there is no lighting proposed and no buildings or staff or anything. So yes, I, I do agree there. Okay. okay. And and I, I agree with Joe that echoes my thinking on it, that it does seem a bit more improved than passive recreation might imply, but for the sake of evaluation, we could consider materially similar use per section 3001D. Um, Michael, anything to add? Michael Lazorsha. Okay. Okay, so that was the first thing we needed to figure out in the staff report. So moving on to page five of the staff report, we're looking at a section that has to do with dimensional standards and accessory structures and uses. We just talked about uses. Um, One of the standards um, in the zoning has to do with the amount of impervious 
surface um, on any given site. And the staff recommendation is that um, we should consider whether this is, whether the way that the track is built creates impervious surface. So she also notes that even if it does, it's well below the maximum allowed. Um, but for the sake of laying the groundwork, no pun intended, for our subsequent conversation about erosion and wetlands, um, I'd be interested in hearing from the applicant about um, how, how this surface will behave. Will water run off of it? Will water soak into it? Um, and, and I'd be interested in knowing that both for the track itself as well as the parking area. Yeah, so um, this uh, surface will be largely impervious, is my understanding. I guess I, I'm, I unfortunately did not uh, see this comment until today, so I haven't consulted. I don't have any expert opinion on this, but the purpose of a pump track is to bring in compacted soil to the extent that it's part that it, it absorbs water. You're going to have the, the material itself is going to disintegrate, and then over time, you're going to lose the pump track. So, I think just by definition, by the nature of the facility oh, there it and, and its purpose, uh, it's got, the water will have to run off of it. I don't, I, I just can't imagine that, uh, what, that it would be designed in a way that allows it to absorb water because if it does, then I think it's going to lose its form and then become less functional. So. Okay. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, questions from the board members about the nature of the surface and we can get into runoff, um, a little bit more later and erosion control later. Um, but, any questions about this section? Yes, I have a question. Um, just through some basic, re I'm not a mountain biker, um, uh, just through basic Google research on a pump track, I see they can be constructed in a number of different ways. You said compacted soil, but I've seen some pictures online where all the area that isn't, you know, for biking on has been uh, seeded and grass. Are you planning on doing that in this area, or could you shed some more light on the well, I don't think we'd do anything to it. I think we would leave it as is. So to the extent that there's, I mean, there's some vegetation on the site right now that would be largely undisturbed. I don't think the intent is not to create, um, you know, a park or stuff that's going to take some ongoing maintenance. We're really just interested in the track itself, the pump track itself. I guess I was a little unclear. Um, here, maybe I can just pull up a picture real quick of what I'm referring to. Uh, so this is a good example here. I'm just going to share my screen really quick. If that's all right. Sure. Yep. Okay. You can see this picture here on the right. Oh. So yep. like I said, the, it's not a, uh, it's landscape, I suppose, but it's just grass. It would need to be mowed, but that would be the only uh, maintenance, I guess, it would need along the edges and on the interior. Or are you, I'm just wondering, or are you considering all of this area would just be compacted dirt? Well, only the area where you see the bicyclists. I, I mean, I just could say this is a vastly more elaborate. This pump track you're looking at probably would cost 10 times what we're proposing. What we're proposing is sort of a very scaled down minimalist version of something like that, but no improvements on the grassy surface. And we just don't, you know, we haven't raised the money, we don't have staffing. These are, this is not a public facility in the sense that it's not, you know, falling under the purview of the rec department. This is going to be voluntarily maintained. So the idea is to give kids an opportunity of a place to bike, but not to create an other, you know, a park on the site. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, John, and thanks for your question, Joe. I think that um, I, I appreciate that pointer that what we were just looking at there is not quite the design of what we're going to see in Montpelier. That was sort of the the, the, the gold-plated version. We might be doing something a little different, but the point is that the parts that aren't going to be biked on will be pretty much less, un will not be compacted. That's okay. the point. All right. Um, any other questions from DRB members on this issue? Okay, so we might as well dive into the issue that many folks are here to be heard on and uh, that we could learn a little bit more about. Um, so, John Holler, would you please give us um, an overview of how you believe this complies with the um, wetlands and vernal pools based, based on your, um, based on the work you've done? Sure. So the first stop I made was with the state, uh, Shannon Morrison, who's a 
a wetlands expert with the, within the Department of Environmental Conservation. She visited, she and I visited the site, uh, got her input on whether this was going to be uh, uh, something that's consistent with the state uh, regulations. So we walked the site. I had several conversations with her, and uh, some of the subsequent emails I think are included um, uh, in the materials that you received. She wanted to ensure that we have a 50-foot setback from the existing uh, uh, streams. We've done that. The, the, the wetland itself is pretty well demarcated. There's a fairly steep drop-off and embankment. The site itself is very dry. I've been out there and, you know, any uh, outside, of, you know, once the snow melts, it's a very dry, so there's no standing water or any, that, and I've seen any kind of wetlands that are on the site itself. So we designed this in a way that meets the state's requirements uh in terms of a setback um there was a uh, this uh, her suggestion and we we're certainly willing to pursue this to create some kind of buffer to ensure that when the city dumps snow on the site that it doesn't run off i have to say i'm you know i really do think that's the city's obligation so i'm not sure i mean i guess we'll we could do that i don't think putting a buffer there is is too onerous but um you know, to the extent that the city is dumping snow on that site, I think it's their obligation to ensure that it doesn't run off into the streams. It's really, it shouldn't, I mean, we're not creating any, any new um, a burden on the city or, and I don't, my understanding is it hasn't been used for maybe seven years for snow dumping. Uh, it certainly seems appropriate to me to ensure that the city uh, protects that, uh, the streams from runoff from snow that's dumped there. I do question whether that should be an obligation of Mamba since we have nothing to do with the city's decision about where to dump it. I mean, we're going to take about half the site, the other site, a half would be for snow dumping. So even if we weren't uh, proposing this application, uh, those concerns I assume would still be there. I'm sure they would be, the state would say, you know, if the city's going to dump um, snow on an area that's that close to a wetland, they probably should create some barrier. So I, I don't think our application is raising those concerns, should be viewed as raising or creating uh, wetland concerns for the conduct of the city. Having said that, I, I hope that's not, uh, you know, we don't want that to be a determining factor here. We'll do that if we have to and probably work with DPW to come up with whatever appropriate barrier is there, but it seems to me that's really a, a, the city's obligation. Um, should I also just briefly, well, why don't I go ahead and talk about the vernal pool issue, Kate? Okay. Yes, please. Um, so that was an issue that came a little later. I, I didn't talk to the state about that. wasn't aware that this was on, within the scope of the vernal pool regulations. I don't think, though, this triggers any real state concerns since it's, I believe, a unique Montpelier ordinance. I visited the site, and I think I, I located at least what was uh, earlier on the map. I, I think that's been filled in with stone. It's not, I don't, I couldn't locate anything that resembled a vernal pool on that site. Um, others may have seen it. I didn't, I saw from the staff report, um, well, she didn't, the staff report didn't re respond to that issue. It talks about the distance or the parking, the fact that there's a parking lot between this proposal and the vernal pool that's designated on the staff, but not whether the vernal pool exists. And I, so I, I just, I don't know. I'm, you know, clearly not an expert. I didn't see it. I had heard that before that somebody had raised a concern with me. This was before we even proposed this, that somebody had dumped uh, some kind of like stone fill in that area. So I'm not sure it exists, uh, you know, unfortunately. But then I just also point out that what we're building is uh, across a parking lot and a road from that site. So to the extent that there's a vernal pool there, um, you know, I, I, I just don't think that this creates, um, is going to create a, a burdens or impacts on that pool given you know, that it's already surrounded by a fairly dense, small, but, but dense residential area and parking area. We would be located on the other side of both, well, the, the, those housing, the parking lot, and then a, a, a class four road or a trail. Thanks for that overview, John. Um, so board members, I um, just to remind you that we have seven standards that need to be met to make sure that rental pools and wetlands are um, being appropriately treated and the overall thing that we're trying to assure is that the affected the development in this area not have an undue adverse impact on the wetland or the vernal pool um so with that uh, with, 
uh, I'd invite DRB members to ask any questions of the applicant about this part of the project. Yeah, Rob. Um, well, so I know that we're going to get into runoff uh, before, but they come together. So I just didn't, uh, I just, my question is, is that will there be any drainage uh, to collect the runoff from the pump track itself? Not the snow storage area, but just the pump track itself. Will there be drainage around there? You know, I don't think it's designed, the pump track is designed in a, well, I'll put it another way. I think it's designed in a way that any runoff would be diffused. So you're going to have runoff off, of, obviously, off of each individual mound, and there'll probably be a dozen or more individual mounds. But that runoff is not going to be collected in any kind of centralized place. I think it would be dispersed on the site off of each of those little mounds. So I don't, I don't think that this site, the way it's constructed, is going to create any consolidated runoff. This as I understand it. Kevin's muted. Kevin, you're muted. Kevin, you're muted. Sorry about that. That, that makes a lot more sense. Uh, John, could, could you just tell us again what the mounds are covered with? What is the material? Uh, it's uh, dirt from North Montpelier. We have a site, uh, I don't remember this, I didn't come prepared with the name of the company, but uh, somebody who's built, um, I think he's an owner of a, of a facility that provides materials for construction of the sites. He's built uh, personally dirt tracks for a little a motocross and so familiar with the kind of the needs so of it, soil with sort of compacted soil so it has so it's high, compacted soil it's not like there's fiberglass or something like that no no it. it's all natural soil it'd be all okay. natural soil with a high level of clay so that it stays or at least some level of clay so that it stays compacted okay so there's a lot of water a lot of water that could potentially collect in the within the track itself i mean if it's clay and so forth there's going to be runoff but it's not as though you have an impervious surface on top of the uh, mound no. itself. It's all natural. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And we, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm just, and I would say, you know, the, to the point of it being impervious, I mean, to the extent it runs off, we lose the invent, we lose the project. So it does have to be built in a way that lasts. Do you, do you have an estimate of how much fill will be required? I am told, and we've budgeted for 150 yards. Is it, is it expected that um, there'd be need to be routine maintenance with additional fill brought in um, from time to time? I don't, that's a good question. I mean, I don't think in the short term, we certainly haven't budgeted for that, don't plan on it. So I would say no, you know, may, we may be back to you in 10 years, but my hope would be that it would be at least a 10 year investment. Okay, other, other questions, uh, well, maybe related, you know, our staff report notes on page, top of page eight that there ha we have not received existing or proposed grading plans. Um, is that still the case or have those been submitted, have grading plans been submitted since the packet went out? You know, when I first approached the city about this, I was told this would be an administrative approval that we'd get in 10 minutes. So. Uh, this has all been new okay. to me, and as I saw the staff report, I was a little overwhelmed at what this has yeah. become. Uh, we thought this okay. was going to be a minor application with a simple process for approval. So this has grown into something that's obviously much more complex, but no, we haven't. And I wasn't even aware that that was uh, something that we might need to submit. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Okay, so is the design such that um, you, so it sounds like the recommendation of, looking in my notes here, there's a recommendation from the state wetlands expert to, a determination that you're not within the 50 foot buffer of the wetland and a recommendation to fence it so that people don't bike into it by mistake. Are, is, are both of those things true? Is, is does the pump does the pump track stay out of the buffer? It does. It, the closer I thought, my understanding. I I went back and looked at her emails uh, today. Her concern was with the snow storage runoff, not the use of the property by a pump for the pump track. I could be wrong about that, but that was my understanding. Her her concern is 
is the runoff and of course what the material that's in the snow that, that runs off into right. the stream. Okay. And would you be open to a condition um, requiring uh, delineation of any buffer that yeah. not land, I'm not asking for landscaping, but delineation of a buffer that would assure that people using the pump track don't end up in in the wetlands? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, kind of going through my notes here. All right. So what I'd like to do next is um, turn to the folks who are here to be heard on this. And the order I'm going to go in is Paige, John, Ned, and David um, speaking specific, asking to speak specifically and concisely to the vernal pools and wetlands. So if you wouldn't mind taking just Two, two minutes each. Um, you've now heard a little bit more about the project, and so I would ask you to um, share with us any any new information that you want to make sure we hear and consider. So, starting with Paige, make sure you unmute there. Sorry. Um, I right. submitted comments very late in the day today, so if it's okay, I'd like to read them. Um, uh, full disclosure, I'm a member of the Conservation Commission, but my comments uh, are not on behalf of the Commission because I'm not um, approved by them to make these comments, but they're informed by my membership and by the concerns of the Commission. Um, it's definitely within the 500 foot protection area around the vernal pool. In my letter, if anybody's had a chance to read it, I said I would suspect that the project would not have an impact on the vernal pool because the site is on the other side of the road and it's away from the woods and that the land and vegetation on the proposed site are not of the type that would be likely to support the amphibians that utilize the vernal pool as a breeding ground. However, John, uh, Jose will correct me on that and I'm grateful for his comments. Um, there is an obvious wetland which needs to be protected and so I'm asking for, um, I want to suggest the following conditions. One is to mark the 50 foot buffer around the wetland um, before construction begins to be sure it's not encroached upon. Uh, two is to provide erosion control between the project and the river and wetland during construction. Three is to take steps to protect the wetland from runoff. And this is from the, the pump track, not the, the snow parking. That is not, um, that's not part of this application. Um, but it could include um, fencing around the perimeter of the track to make sure people don't walk or ride into the wetland and or planting native vegetation on the riverside of the track to mitigate runoff from the raised area and control erosion. Um, four is to create as little soil disturbance as possible given the toxic nature of the soil that's been subjected to snow dumping and all of the associated contaminants that are in that and compaction for a long time. And five is to use gravel only for the parking lot, not paving, if they could do that. I would also ask um, why the parking lot is necessary when there's a paved dead end road adjacent, adjacent to the proposed site that's plenty wide enough for cars to park and for city trucks to get by, which they want to be able to do. Um, if the parking lot were eliminated, the whole pump track could be moved further away from the wetland area. Okay. Thanks, Paige. And, and what we'll do rather than a back and forth is um, John will give you another, John Holler will give you another chance to talk at, at the end um, if, if some of these concerns aren't addressed as we go along. Um, questions from DRV members for Paige? Uh, yes. Do you know the location of the ball pool exactly? It seems like there's. Yes. It's on the other side of the road. Um, you know where the. And by the road, you mean Cumming Street? Sorry, Cumming Street. Street. You, um, yeah. where the bike track goes up across from the apartments that are on the left-hand side as you're driving toward the site, there's a bike trail that goes up and there's a sign, a new sign right at the bottom of it, if you've been out there. And the mm -hmm. vertical pool is just to the left of that sign and it kind of runs along the, um, it kind of, Thank you. it kind of runs along the road, um, but it's right at the edge of the forest. And right now I was down there this morning to look at the site and it's completely overgrown. So you wouldn't see it. Um, it, there was, it was, um, full of wood frogs and, um, spring peepers this spring when I was down there. And it's a state recognized vernal pool, I believe. Great. 
Thanks, thanks for that question and that answer. Um, other questions from DRB members? Okay, um, so then next up is John Jose, uh, about two minutes of comments, if, if you would, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Kate. Um, I want to apologize as I only found out about this project as of today. Um, otherwise, I would have offered comments sooner. Um, a little bit of background on me. I have an interest in matters related to natural resource conservation in Montpelier. Um, I was formerly on the Montpelier Conservation Commission, and I have a particular interest in amphibian conservation. And when I was on the uh, commission, uh, we undertook an, an effort to identify at least uh, what, what are, represent some of the uh, vernal poles uh, in Montpelier, including the one that's located uh, in proximity to this project. Um, and also, um, because of how easily accessible uh, the wetlands uh, areas are down on Cumming Street, and the fact that I used to live down there for a few years, I had the opportunity to spend some time down there including evenings when spring migration was taking place. And my own observations are that when this migration is taking place early in the spring, which consists of um, amphibians such as wood frogs, uh, spotted salamanders, green frogs, uh, spring peepers, um, at least the wood frogs that I've uh, observed had the opportunity to watch down there um, one of the places they cross, and at least one spring when I was down there where they were concentrating their crossing, was precisely the area where the project is located. Um, they were coming down off the hillside, as far as I could tell, down off the hillside, um, uh, and I believe bypassing the vernal pool and moving to uh, the beaver pond wetlands uh, to breed in there. There's a substantial, within the past couple years, there's a su substantial population of wood frogs um, that is that started to breed and continues to breed um, in, the, in those beaver pond wetlands that have been identified. <clears throat> and that's part of what this is about, is it's not just a vernal pool and wetlands and amphibians breeding there or utilizing their habitat, it's the movement of these amphibians back and forth between these habitats and other habitats. And also there are overwintering areas. For instance, those um, wood frogs may move back up that hill uh, in the fall to, over, to burrow down shallowly in the soil up on the hillside there and overwinter in a frozen state up there. Um, I'm not opposed to the project because of this, but I, I would like to make a, the recommendation that when the pump track is being developed, to try to avoid to the extent possible that impediments or quote unquote inadvertent track would be created that would pre present a hazard to amphibians trying to move through the area. And keep in mind, when these amphibians are le leaving their breeding wetlands, as are wood frogs right now, they're very, very small, literally the size of a tiny little cricket. Um, so what might not seem like uh, an issue to us for a frog to surmount an obstacle can definitely become an issue for them. Um, and I, uh, this is the first uh, uh, exposure I've had to the idea of this kind of facility and I Googled it real quick and I could see it was kind of this series of dips and rises, kind of a, a mogul kind of structure. And that's the first thing that came to mind was, um, could the construction of this project potentially inadvertently inhibit amphibian movement or even um, create some quote unquote traps uh, for them? And um, I, I do want to state that that Vernal Pool is there, to my knowledge, when I was there about a month ago, I. I stopped in and checked on it and it's one that is um, certified as being present in the city and last thing I'll say is a few years back when Mamba was having some trails installed off Cumming Street some new trails um, I at that time was on the Conservation Commission and I had the opportunity to meet with the gentleman who was constructing the trails we had a very similar very brief conversation where my basic suggestion 
was that he'd do whatever he could to avoid creating steep sides to the trails he was developing in the area of the vernal pool or any other potential impediments to the amphibians moving from and to the vernal pool. So again, that's what I'm basically asking be taken into consideration in the construction of this project. Um, I'm not opposed to it. It's just that whatever can be done, be done um, to not impede uh, the movement of the amphibians um, in this lowland area when they're moving between their, their um, breeding habitats and upland habitats and such. Great. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that, that perspective and, and that request. That, um, that is helpful. Um, and Ned, uh, and, and Ned, if, if you wouldn't mind sticking to um, the, what we're talking about now, the vernal pools, wetlands, buffer, and you could talk about the hazard area and river corridor, but um, we'll save parking for la later. Sure, sure. And it sounds like I really can't speak to uh, whether this is active recreation or passive, that's already a, a separate issue, right? And whether they have a stormwater permit? Um, we we require that state those. permit be granted. Yeah, thank you. We'll, 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 get, we'll get to that a little bit later, but consider them flagged. So, so, so it is actively a, a, a very wonderful wetland. It's a hot spot. I walk to it all the time in the spring. It's full of wood frogs. The vernal pool is very active there, as it was described by Paige. Um, Flushed uh, a hooded merganser off it this spring. Also, the, the wetlands, you know, with the beavers, uh, wood ducks, and uh, all sorts of activity all through there. I found a bittern in there not too long ago. So it's a it's a hammered wetland. It's been filled, uh, you know, through the whole process of probably illegal and overlooked fill. I've seen some images on Google. Uh, earth where it, you can see the, the blackness rolling off of the piles of snow melts. So there's, there's some real historical issues with that site for sure, but it's a very active spot and uh, it would be a shame to uh, take a place that's so hammered and uh, instead of uh, perhaps restoring it for wetland function and buffer function and floodplain function, uh, increase the problem. So I, I am very alarmed about that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any any questions for Ned, Ned or John from board members? Yeah, uh, I just had a question. We're talking about barriers during construction. Uh, do you have any uh, sort of specific examples? And I know I've seen like at some points, uh, if installed uh, incorrectly, like sill fence can be a barrier, temporary barrier to these creatures. But uh, seems like you guys you guys know more about this, uh, you know, than I do. So I just didn't know if you had any specific alternatives um, to uh, you know stuff that would, you know, control runoff, but uh, also uh, allow passage of, uh, you know, amphibians uh, through the site. And you're asking about con during construction in particular, Rob? During construction, yes. Okay. It, it, it's very tricky. I won't speak to that much, but it would be a tricky issue for sure, Rob. And I do believe that Shannon Morrison had talked about putting up permanent barriers, such as Jersey barriers to kind of block access into the into the buffer and protect the wetland from including snow dumping uh, traffic and uh, and the sprawl from the site. So, but that's a very interesting question. I can respond to that as well, Kate. Okay, yeah, go ahead. I think um, there's a couple things that can take into consideration depend on, depending on the uh, extent, the length of the vernal uh, excuse me, uh, of the silt fence. Um, this would so be something we'd want to look into some more, but it may well be that the animals can get around it, work their way around it. Um, that's one possibility. Um, the other thought is um, timing. Um, most crucially, um, and if, if the project could take this into consideration, your, your big movement of amphibians to their breeding pools is going to take some take place somewhere um, mid plus or minus uh, April, um, and usually there's uh, either one large night or a few different nights that they move on. Um, so if uh, can timing of the um, project could take that into consideration, uh, I think that's one possibility that can could address concerns around a barrier like a silt fence impeding their movement. Great. Thank you. 
All right. If there are no other questions from DRB members, I want to move on and give David his um, two minutes. So, David, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. This is uh, David. Um, so, my concerns is also the uh, the wetlands and the burn of pool. Um, but it sounds to me that the uh, um, Mamba is saying that um, you know it, it's it's not going to the once the track is built, there's not going to be um, any maintenance or upkeep uh, for the uh, facility. Um, so my concern is that if it does get built, um, I think there should be provisions uh, that um, will will ensure. Um, with um, you know the constant monitoring that uh, uh, the movement, migration, and wintering of all these um, amphibians and, and um, ducks and beavers and groundhogs and uh, deer and um, you know turkeys. Or, there's everything here. Um, so I, I think that um, there should be some kind of um, um, you know, ongoing monitoring to make sure, you know, everything's working out okay. And if it doesn't, um, you know, um, there should be changes made. Um, and, you know, in the future, if this uh, track isn't going to be used, um, there be, uh, should be money set aside for uh, its, its removal. Um, so thank, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Thank you, David. Okay, um, great. So we, is, is that everyone who, wanted to be heard on this application before I turn back over to John Holler. All right, so I want to give John Holler um, five or six minutes to respond, and um, then the board can ask questions, and then we'll, we'll move on. Um, before I do that, um, everybody's disappeared from video for me, and I wonder if that has to do with my internet connection or if it has to do with people just sort of listening silently and quiet, quietly. Are others having trouble with video feed? I just didn't, wasn't sure the protocol myself. No, there's uh, nobody I, breaking any rules. I'm just wondering if my computer's broken. <laughs> uh, Kate, I can see um, most people. I can see uh, four, eight, um, 11 okay. people. Okay, so it's on my end and I'll just, I'll go with that. But know that I can't see you raise your hand. So that's what that means. Um, all right, so um, John Holler, go, go ahead and um, if you want to, to respond to some of those, those concerns and reflections or let, yeah, us, sure. let us know what you so, want to say. Yeah. Well, well I'm mean, I trying to organize how I would respond. So maybe just a, a couple of things. Um, first, respond to Paige's question about the parking. Why do we need parking? You know, honestly, we went back and forth about that. I don't think very many people are going to drive there. I hope they don't. It's bikeable from downtown. Um, you know, I bike to those trails. Um, and there also is people, you, there's Cumming Street is a pretty wide road. So people typically now there's no parking for the North Branch uh, trails. There's probably much more vehicle traffic, I would think, bringing bikers there to that site and they park on Cumming Street. Um, I'm not sure about the road, the access road that goes to, towards the river. That's when I know Tom McCardle was concerned about that being open. We did look at whether that was wide enough or putting parking on the other side. You know, I guess ultimately we just came down to the fact that this is going to be convenient. We had enough room on the site, but it wouldn't be paved. It would just be gravel or some kind of very minimal, minimally maintained or, or uh, uh, upgraded surface to allow for parking. But it's not, I don't think, critical, but I do think it would be convenient to have, uh, but not not intending any pavement, certainly. Uh, and haven't budgeted for that. Um, you know, I share John's uh, Jose's concern about uh, about the frog migration. We certainly don't want to do anything that's going to impede that, or, or uh, you know, to, that's going to have some an adverse impact on um, the uh, amphibian movement in that area. I'd be interested in maybe having John talk. He, I think he, I think it was John who mentioned talking to the trail developer, um, uh, Brooks Gatcher, who's done these all over the state. And I'm sure he would be amenable to having a conversation about how this could be constructed in a way that minimizes the uh, uh, vernal pool or the uh, migration from frogs. And then one of the concerns is the timing of this. So um, I think John or, or maybe it was Ned mentioned that mid-April mid was the peak period for migration. 
this site would only be used when it is dry, and we would probably close it. Uh, maybe I'm not sure. We haven't talked about that. How we'd rope it off? It's a, maybe they, we do that with trails when the trails aren't suitable for biking, uh, and then open them. So there's a there's a site that you, you refer people to to determine whether the trails are open, and that changes during the course of the year. But but there's a period of time uh, before which the trails aren't open when they're just not suitable for riding. That's usually you know, well, it depends on the conditions, but maybe May, early May, but mid-April is almost never. I don't think trails would be suitable for riding. And I, I think that's probably the case here. Um, if the trail, the bike pump is wet or there's still snow on it, we certainly wouldn't want people on it. So, you know, I think there's a way that we could maybe have a conversation about how to ensure that it's not used at a time when there may be a movement on that site. Yeah. Um, John, if I could interrupt you, if, if I could interrupt you for a second, John, um, I think. Do you know what time of year this would be constructed if you get your permit? Oh, uh, this summer, this year. This summer. Okay. Yeah. So construction that's, that's would not goal. likely building, interfere with with the migration. No, no, not at all. He's uh, okay. finishing work on the existing trails network uh, this summer and hoping to do the uh, when he finishes sometime this summer. Okay, early, great. Early, Thanks. Early fall. Um. I guess that's all I have to offer. Okay, that's helpful, great. Um, any other questions on this issue from DRB members before we move on? All right, thanks everybody for bearing with us. Good conversation and informative for us. So um, the next item that we're looking at, page eight of the staff report has to do with erosion control, which we've discussed a little bit. Um, the staff recommendation, the, con the staff recommends a condition of approval, which is that prior to, con you know, um, for, first a, a sort of a typical um, requirement is that, um, no, I'm sorry, one thing at a time. The staff suggests a condition of approval that um, the applicant submit to the zoning administrator an erosion control plan to show compliance with this part of our zoning, which is called Section 3008D, and um, that has been signed off on by the Department of Public Works. So, um, John Holler, could, uh, would you be open to that condition? Yes. Great. And. Um, you talked a little bit about erosion control. Um, just, could you provide assurance that you're going to be following the practices as, as delineated in, in our zoning, which is, again, 3008? Um, those are to limit the size of the construction area to the minimum necessary, preserve existing trees where possible. Um, as, as we heard in discussion of the wetlands, marking site boundaries to identify the limits of construction. Um, and I would say, I've, probably also the limits of those wetlands, limit exposed soil, stabilize the construction entrance, et cetera, install silt fences, divert storm water, treat and filter water as necessary. Um, yes. Um, so are you prepared to comply with those requirements? Yes. Yes. Okay. Qu questions from the board on that, on erosion control and management during construction? Yeah, and I guess I, I do have one question. Uh, the existing access, um, you know, it's kind of the old gravel road, the tra you know, the trail there, um, obviously be upgraded some during construction. Um, do you see any concerns like sort of long term needed? Doesn't it cross a ditch or there and there's a culvert? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken. <laughs> I don't, you know, if it crosses a culvert, I'm not sure. Um, you know, we'll, I, I guess this is sort of an ancillary response, but the question did come up about maintenance of this, uh, and Mamba is taking on the obligation to maintain the pump track, and we've done that with trails uh, throughout this region, including the North Branch trails. We have, I mean, I was out just, I mean, just to sort of anecdotally mention that I think there were 30 people out working on the trails maybe a month ago. So we have a very active network of really committed volunteers to maintain these trails. And I think we'll have the same kind of enthusiasm for people who uh, support this pump track. I don't, so it's a long way of saying that. I, I, I'm not sure whether this is gonna create access issues. I don't recall that on that site, but I haven't thought about it like in terms of the truck traffic and bringing the loads of dirt. But um, I can just, I mean, I can certainly ensure that we'll maintain it and make sure that it's accessible. I mean, it'd be 
have no problem at all with the condition like that. Thanks. All right. So um, what I'd like to move on to next is um, page nine and 10, which has to do with access and circulation. Um, so John Holler, if you could, um, you, you spoke, you said that you expect people to access, you hope for people to access the site by bike, um, though some may also come by car. Um, do you have any sense of the volume of use that there will be? You know, we really don't. It's hard to compare. So the, the nearest popular pump track is in Waterbury, uh, but that's a couple of miles from downtown, a smaller community and an area that gets a lot of uh, people coming from out of town to that site. So, you know, it's really hard to say. We've put in the, the we had said nine, uh, 10 spaces, the DRB staff had said you, we could put nine there under the existing rules, which mm -hmm. of course that's fine. Um, I'm, I'd be really surprised if you ever saw that many vehicles on the site or, or that many people on the site at one time, but I, it's just, I just don't know. I mean, we hope it's popular. We hope it's used. I hope people bike there. Um, but mostly we just want people to be able to enjoy it. Okay. Thanks. Um, questions from the board about access and circulation. Anything else board members need to know to make a determination in this area? All right, so I'm going to move on to the parking and loading areas. Um, we just talked about um, parking, that 10 spaces were proposed, but if the spaces meet the required dimensional re requirements, um, there can only be nine spaces. And it sounds like your, you, your understanding of that um, as the applicant. Um, and we talked about how that will be a gravel surface. Uh, one question that we're curious about is, um, Will it says that no snow storage area for the parking lot is indicated? Um, will the parking lot will, will the track be used in the winter? And so, will it be necessary to clear the parking lot in the winter? No, purely no. seasonal. Okay. So, 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 I would say May to okay. you know maybe late October, mid to late October. Okay, okay. So, snow storage isn't an, isn't an issue. No. Um, great. Um, any other questions from board members about the parking area? Okay, so a, poss a possible condition, again, I know you started out as minor site plan and this has become a more involved conversation, but um, to, to complete, to, to put a bow on this um, before getting the permit, um, we would ask for submission of a site plan that shows in a little more detail where those parking spaces are going so we can kind of have an idea of how people are coming and going sure. and, and using the site. And that would be for the record. Thanks. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Um, Okay, bike and pedestrian access and circulation. I think we, we've talked about that and we have a sense of how it's connected. Um, last item, I believe, to really discuss is landscaping and screening. Um, again, forgive me, I'm looking at my notes. So, um, we are interested in knowing a little bit about whether there's any plan to screen the use from the apartments. Um, between the parking area and the housing development to the east, if that is um, under consideration by the group. So we haven't talked about that. We haven't, as I mentioned or alluded to, we haven't spent a lot of time on parking because it's really not the purpose of this. Um, we hope that it's parking is not gonna be necessary, but I did notice that in the staff report, that was a new issue for me, it hadn't been, you know, so we really haven't discussed that issue at all. But I did note, notice in the in the zoning regulations the screening standard and it says that screening shall be applied to minimize the visibility and impacts of incompatible disruptive or visually unappealing aspects of proposed development on the surrounding neighborhood i would argue that if we're if there is going to be uh, parking there it's it, a maximum of nine spaces it's not going to be uh, um, you know visually unappealing or um, yeah, incompatible, disruptive, or visually unappealing. I mean, this is, there's a large parking lot that is in the center of that residential area. This would be, I don't know, some distance when, on behind the apartments across um, this trail. I, I guess I'd just question whether if we put nine, unit, nine a space for nine uh, cars on a un relatively unimproved surface that that's gonna create, trigger that screening requirement. 
Um, we have to have a, we didn't we don't have money in the uh, budget. We haven't budgeted for screening. I don't know what that would entail. I think there's also was a recommendation that it be certified by an architectural landscaper. We certainly don't have a budget for that. So uh, you know, there's also a question whether we just abandon the parking altogether if that additional mm -hmm. cost was was uh, was required. But I'm just not sure. I mean, as I look at this and think about adding additional nine spaces when you already have a pretty substantial parking area right there on the site in the front of those houses or those uh, apartments that this is going to meet that uh, condition. Okay. So I think what we're probably comparing it to is what's there now, which is more like a meadow uh, rather than what's, what can be seen from the houses, which you're right, is parking. Um, so that's sort of the balance we're looking at um, when we're thinking about disruptiveness. Um, questions from board members about, about this issue or um, thoughts, opinions? Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't see any. Hey, Kate, this is Michael. Please watch check. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Um, so from the applicant, I'm, I'm, I'm really confused about your, your parking. Do you want the nine spaces or, or do you not? You seem to be going back and forth. And I'm, and I'm just curious, do you actually want those spaces? Oh, we do. They're in the, no, no, they're in the application. We do want the parking because I think that creates more flexibility and more opportunity for people to use the site. But I think what I was saying is that I'm not sure that that if there's screening that's required and that we have to hire a landscape um, consultant to certify that the screening we've done is adequate. I don't know how many thousands of dollars we're talking about. We haven't budgeted for that. Is that you know, in balance, then is the parking going to be worth it? Um, so yes, we do want to have the parking. Um, not sure it would be worth it if we have to meet that uh, requirement. I'm not sure I'd have to consult with other people. But um, so. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And, and um, Kate, are we are we trying to screen the parking or or the the uh, you know the track itself? Because when I read through the material, it sounded to me that the screening would only come into effect if we were concerned about screening the actual track and not so much the parking. I believe it's about the project as a whole. Right. Um, we, we do have other instances where we require the, the screening of parking in particular. Um, Mike Miller, I don't know if I could put you on the spot about that and ask for your help interpreting. Yeah, I was trying well, to I, I, read through. I, I guess just for maybe, you know, thought for the group, I don't know that I really, mm -hmm. to be honest, I don't know that I really care at all about screening parking. Like the applicant said, it's a parking lot. There's going to be, you know, potentially nine additional cars. I don't know that that really matters. So to me, the, the larger question for the board is, do we want to screen or require the applicant to screen this track from what sounds like is basically an unused parcel that may or may not have been used to dump snow on. So I, I guess just, um, I would like to know what we're trying to analyze the purpose of screening for. As, as I look at the proposed coming street pump track uh, in our packet, which is page seven of our overall packet, um, it's the GIS printout um, showing the wetlands, the wetland budget layer, snow storage, pump track, and parking. Um, the screening of the parking would screen it from Cummings Street. Um, and again, what we're comparing it to is currently when you drive by there, it's an open, open field wetland. Um, so it would be screened from that as well as from the backyards of, of folks who live in the Cummings Street apartment. Um, because the, it's, it's not being added to an existing parking lot, it's a new it's a new um, it's, it's a new area of parking that in in a previously undeveloped area. So I think that's why we're talking about it. Thank you, Michael. So the parking area is the um, the rectangle, the dark gray rectangle that has the arrow dancing around it. So it, it is a new a new area. Okay. Um, other board members have some questions or thoughts about this. Yeah. Um, right. um, oh, hold on. Yeah, Rob, go ahead. 
Yeah, yeah. I just thought I had you know the nine spaces, and it seems like that's not an essential uh, number to serve the project. But um, one thought was ensure that there's space for an emergency vehicle to you know come in and turn around there. Um, it seems like there is, but uh, if the applicant believes so, knowing the site more better. Okay, so question to the applicant, yeah. Um, well, there certainly would be the way the site plan has been submitted, and that's a good point. I think we'd want to make sure that that is uh, available, that space is available. Okay. And I, I believe this was reviewed by the Chief of Police and the Fire Department um, and found to be adequate for emergency access. All right, so um, we have taken testimony on um, all the items in the staff review, and again, I thank you all for your patience and um, going into detail on things. So at this point, um, I can't see you all. I'm going to sign off and sign on again after this application, so maybe we can see each other. But um, what is the pleasure of the board? Our options are to um, discuss and then vote, or have a private del um, a deliberative session, which would be just board members, uh, in order to deliberate, um, determine conditions, and then vote. Um, what what is the pleasure? And that could happen. Uh, either later this evening or it could happen um, at another time that we agree to meet together. So based on what you know and what you're comfortable with this application, board members, what's, what's your pleasure? Uh, this is Michael. I want to add my, I would like the deliberative session for this one. Okay. And we could do that later. What other board members? I, I was going to okay. say that, that I did not see a need for a deliberative session, but I'm willing to go go with one if the, that's the board's inclination. This is Joe. I'm comfortable uh, voting now and not going to deliberative session. Um, this is Roger. Uh, likewise, I'm comfortable voting now. OK. Kate, this All right, is so I'm going. Um, yeah. This, um, do you want to talk sure. about floodplains or river corridors at all or not do that? Ned, thank you for raising that. Um, I appreciate that. If, if, it's, if it's okay with other board members, I'd like to acknowledge Ned's, um, Ned's point. Um, it is in our staff report, and I, I, um, I believe, yes, I, I'm going to take two minutes of testimony on this from, from Ned. Thank you for jumping in. Uh, go right ahead. Thank you. I, I've probably appeared at various other hearings um, as a state comment from NC Natural Resources in terms of regional floodplain manager for floodplain issues. And uh, I'm not speaking um, under my official hat tonight. I'm speaking as a resident of Montpelier concerned about the situation, but I did want to just kind of point out what I understood to be some of the elements that come in. And one of the, one of the curious things about the Montpelier process is that after it goes to the DRB, then it goes for the floodplain river corridor permit at the very tail end. And it would be really nice if there was a better way to integrate these things so that it doesn't turn out to be um, so disjointed. Um, so it, the whole area is in the floodplain and uh, this is fill in the floodplain. And the city does not have any restrictions against fill in the floodplain. I, I live right up against the North Branch downstream. And as we add fill into the floodplain, it flows uh, higher and faster in various ways. It, it flows higher in some places and it may flow with more velocity in other places. So as we do that, it does increase the risk to people already closer in the floodplain um, elsewhere in town. Um, one standard the state uses in the model is no net fill. So if you add something, you have to add something, you take something away. This, this doesn't necessarily do that. And again, the city does not have a standard about that. Um, it's not in the floodway, which is a big concern. It is in the river corridor. And so that's a, a big uh, step that the city took to enable the protection of a river corridor along the North Branch itself and only along the North Branch upstream of the Cumming Street Bridge. And uh, that's based in large part, as I understand, about some of the dialogue statewide about river corridors and river corridor protection. Um, but in fact, it is a municipal standard adopted by the city for the city's reasons. It pretty much says you don't do new things in the river corridor, except maybe small accessory structures. 
You don't put fill in. And, and part of the logic on the state idea, the state concept of river corridors is we're trying to create room for rivers and streams to change over time. Their positions will incrementally adjust and, uh, and that way they'll have the room they need to maintain the least erosive gradient down the valley and do the least amount of damage as it continues down on through Waterbury and beyond. Um, and so that's, that's really what it's about conceptually. And that helps homeowners and business owners and the city um, and the roads and all these things all the way through the system. So in this case, as I would understand it, the river corridor is basically to say in this area that is not highly channelized, one of the last remaining sections in the city that isn't, um, that we're trying to not put in new things any closer to the top of the bank than we already have and to give some, leave some room for the river. That's the basic concept as I would conceive of it, I can be corrected in terms of how a player interprets that. Um, and and the, the dirt, you know, construction of the pump track is, uh, is, an, is an interesting thing. You know, it seems ephemeral. You know, it's compacted soil. It's complex. It's not going to be asphalt yet. Um, but it does, it, it poses this question in my mind, is this something that is, uh, you know, just kind of a playground and it's gone? Or is this the beginning of something that is loved and cherished and enhanced and uh, becomes more and more precious and needs to be protected against the river over time? So that, that would be the way in which I would look at the proposal. Um, so that's just, I'm just putting that out there as such. Um, it's an H and H issue, it doesn't need a no-rise uh, analysis, but it's basically a, a nature of the kind of proposal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, Ned. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I might like to ask if, if Mike Miller has anything to add about the order of operations with our permitting that would provide some clarification on how the river corridor issue will be addressed for this project. Um, well, applicants have, can address their various permits in any, any order that they want. They kind of, they can pick them on the ones they think are the most critical to get first. Um, so presumably um, this application has already been talked because all of our flood rules are all administrative. They've already been working with Audra and I don't know specifically how in depth this conversation has been with them already, with her already mm -hmm. and with them. So okay. it's possible that Maybe this has have. already been discussed and is already on its way um, because our permits are mostly administrative. Okay, is, is that the case, John? And I keep saying John Holler because we got yeah. two, two on the call tonight. Um, what's the status of the River Corridor Regulation Permit? Yeah, so we've had a number of conversations about this. Um, and honestly, it's not clear what the right approach is. I mean, I, uh, I know Audra has, has mentioned this no net fill requirement. So the, basically that would mean if we're bringing on 150 yards of soil, we need to take off, we need to remove 150 yards of soil. We think that's a, a terrible idea environmentally to disturb 150 yards of soil. It, it, um, we don't know what that use has been. And you, I think, have a couple of emails from Alec Ellsworth from the uh, plant, from the uh, Parks Commission, who's very opposedly strongly supports this project and is willing to do what we need to to make it uh, done. But th that does not seem to me to be in the spirit of this rule. We would, I think, create valleys and sort of unnatural uh, dips uh, below the surface uh, in the interest of meeting this standard, which really wasn't intended to apply to a facility like this. So I made the argument in the submission that I provided to the, and I thought that the uh, DRB would be making this determination, uh, not that it would be administrative. So I made that argument that that this is not a structure under the Montpelier zoning ordinance. The, the term structure is intend, refers to you know what you would normally think of as a uh, a building or other kinds of an, an improvement. But uh, this kind of a dirt improvement is we didn't think uh, would argue is not a structure. I included a case um, from another uh, community in Vermont applying a similar definition of the term structure. I gather that's okay. not your determination. I'm so I guess I'll follow up with no. Mike to see where we make that case okay. 
an argument. I'll have, to, I'll have to hear from Audra to see where she came. I, I don't know where there would be a no net fill requirement unless you were in the flood way. But yeah. I, I, I really, I don't like to overstep because although I'm a certified floodplain manager myself, I, I always fall back on the people who do this every day and that, you know, and that's Audra who does the floodplain and Meredith who does the zoning. And so as, as much as I have experience in working with all of these, um, when you do it every day, you, you remember where that requirement is that I'm overlooking right now. Yeah, so I, I'm happy to, you know, we'll continue this conversation. So the, the upshot of it is DPW has agreed to haul away if we need, if we're required to do that 150 yards of soil and place it elsewhere that's not in the river corridor. So that's this, you know, that meets the requirement of if, if uh, the floodway river corridor provisions, I think it was section 803 applies that that's how we'd meet this no net fill. We would take away as much as we bring in and, and uh, DPW has agreed to do that. Well, I'm hoping we can avoid that. I'm not sure that's the best outcome for the environment. So I think we continue having those conversations to see what makes sense. Great. Thanks for raising that, Ned, and now we all have clarity on how that particular characteristic of the site is going to be overseen. So, thanks. So, I will turn it back to my um, DRB members. Um, is there any further discussion or questions from DRB members before we talk about a motion? Hey, Kate, this is Michael again. Yeah. Yep, uh, go ahead. So, I... I gotta be honest, I thought this was gonna be a, a straightforward permit. And uh, I'm not really tracking what, and I mean, maybe I'm tired of not paying attention, but I'm not really tracking what we're going to vote on. We're talking about maybe okay. fencing, maybe not fencing, maybe vegetation cover, maybe not. Maybe doing some sort of thermal pool, amphibian protection thing. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just really unclear where we're at on this permit. Okay. okay. Well, thanks. Um, that is okay, and that's why we're, why we're talking. Um, so the conditions that are proposed in the staff report. Um, so first of all, we are assuring that the wetland and vernal pool standards are met, and we are applying conditions as we see fit to make sure that those resources are protected. Some of the things that we've discussed are um, construction during a time when amphibians are not migrating. We have talked about um, a visual buffer between the pump track so that users don't um, stray into the wetlands. We have talked about that buffer not necessarily being a Jersey barrier because that would impede amphibian movement. Um, we have not made a decision about landscaping, um, but if the DRB decides that we want landscaping, that would become a, a condition of the permit. And then we have some standard conditions um, as suggested in the staff report, which I'm flipping to now, having to do with um, the erosion control plan that would be required, copies of state permits, site plans showing, um, showing the buffers, the parking space, parking spaces, and then if we determine a landscaping plan. So that's, that's kind of the scope of what we are contemplating in this motion, I believe, and I would welcome others, uh, DRB members to clarify that for me if, if necessary. I mean, I think the issue is, is that uh, from my perspective, um, I would go with the staff recommendations and leave it at that. Um, if board members feel as though uh, there's a need to discuss the other factors that were brought up, vernal pools, uh, amphibian migration, um, uh, uh, screening, then I would recommend that considering we're doing this by, by Zoom rather than in person, which is an inherent impediment to our ability to, uh, uh, to express this in, in a coherent way in a short period of time then I guess I would suggest we move to deliberative session, um, close the public hearing and, and, and do that. Um, but I'm certainly willing to, uh, to vote now if the board is so inclined. Um, I, I am inclined to because um, there's a lot that we could ponder and deliberate um, 
and, and that I think we need to be on the same page about as board members in order to put together a, a coherent and fair um, motion and, and conditions. So um, is, is there a motion to close, and, and Mike, please correct this motion if it's not technically correct, to close the public hearing on this application and continue in deliberative session? Is there a motion? Well, I don't think you need to close the hearing. I think you just need to enter Close deliberative evidence. session. If you're if you're going to deliberative session now, I believe that's what you would do. Is okay, we're going. I think open? we're going to go. We're going to go to. We're going to. My understanding is we'll go to deliberative session, um, at another out, outside of this Monday night meeting. Okay. Because I don't. I want to move on to the next application. Right. And and, and uh, Kate, I will make that motion to close the. Okay. Uh, Public, oh no, we're not closing the public hearing, excuse me. Uh, to move to deliberative session uh, for consideration of the, uh, uh, the, of the application. Okay, we have a motion, is there a second? I'll second it, Michael Lizardo. Michael seconds, all right. Um, Joe? Uh, I'm comfortable going to deliberative session, yes. Yes, okay, Rob? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there any discussion? Let's ask for discussion. I would just wanted to jump in real quick to go and say we do have to um, go to a date certain. So if we're okay. not if we're not closing the hearing, which I don't think we should close the hearing, then I would say we would move it to a date certain, which would probably be the next meeting, August third. August third. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll and accept then that. I'll schedule, accept a, that. schedule a deliberative session. I'll, I'll, ac um, I'll accept that as a, uh, as a as a friendly amendment to my motion. Thank you, Kevin. Michael, do you accept that as a friendly amendment? Uh, yeah, that sounds great. August third. Okay. So I'll redo the vote, Joe. Yes. Rob? Yes. Roger? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Michael? Uh, yes. And I vote yes as well. Um, so thank you for, for your patience with the process, John Haller and, and everyone. Um, I, I think it will be valuable for us to be able to talk through this just a little bit more um, in our August 3rd meeting at which point we'll make a decision and then be in touch um so thank you very much for your first appearance before the drb <laughs> um appreciate appreciate your participation and thanks to everyone else who who signed on for this as well um appreciate it very much thank you and uh, one uh, one process question real quick uh yes Rob. the public hearing is still open so anything from the public that has additional information that they wish to submit or anything we can that can be submitted and we can review it um, at our deliberative session. Yes. That's it. Thank you. Yes. The reason for keeping the hearing open is if there's at, at any point when you go through your deliberative process at the start of the next meeting, that if there is a question, we don't have to rewarn the hearing. If you close the hearing and then find out we need one more piece of information, then legally we have to rewarn the hearing by leaving the hearing open and continuing it to, to the next meeting then we don't have to rewarn the meeting after your deliberative session. Great. That makes sense. Okay. That's an important clarification. Yeah, thank you. All right, so soon we will move on to the next um, application, but what I'd like to do now is take a 11 minute break. Um, please come back. Oh, there, there are all your faces again. <laughs> um, please come back at 8.47. All right, for DRB members, we have everyone we're waiting for. Um, I wonder if Joe is going to be rejoining us. I have not heard to the contrary. Um, can folks still hear me? I can hear you. I just saw Joe not too long ago. Great. Okay. I keep um, I keep getting booted on and off um, Zoom itself, so. Um, Forgive me if I, if that keeps happening. I'm going to, um, 
proceed, even though I can't see what's, what's going on. Just, um, just, just to let you know, Kate, your voice is coming through fine, but I, I don't have any uh, video of you. Okay. Thank you. And I don't have any video of anyone. I'm only okay. basically joined by phone by now, but you know, I'm going to do my best to just keep rolling along. Um, it is, that is my goal to wrap this up by 10 o'clock or sooner if we can, while also not, um, rushing or marginalizing any, any concerns or rushing any information collection. We do want to do this right. We don't like to make it a habit to go to meetings or three, but, um, it, it has happened as folks on this call now. Right. I, um, so let's, let's, Dive in. That, let me just say one thing. Uh, I, I totally support your 10 o'clock uh, uh, drop dead time. I think it's important that we uh, contain uh, the testimony and the deliberations within uh, a context when people are still basically awake. So I, I agree with your 10 o'clock time frame. Okay, thanks. Let's even aspire for more than basically awake, but entirely <laughs> ready. <laughs> And, and in service of our applicants and, and neighbors and community all around. Um, oh, of course. I know that's what you meant. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna click, I'm gonna stay here on phone and click my Zoom link again, but, but I am gonna get, get started. So thank you all for being here. Um, the next application is for general, uh, we're, we're looking at general standards, minor site plan, conditional use review and design review at 99 State Street. And we're familiar with this area of town because we've had some conversations about it um, this spring and summer. But one of the things that I think we need to remember is that we are making decisions about this application um, based on what's been submitted for this application, both from the applicant and from anyone else who, who is participating. So while we may be aware of the overall context, which is kind of our job as DRB members, we know the context of our community. Um, we, we, as far as evidence is concerned, to decide whether this is meeting the zoning, we're, we're taking evidence tonight. Okay. So, um, with that, um, I would like to swear in witnesses and, um, Mike Miller, would you please let me know who the witnesses are since I can't see anybody at the moment. I'm still working on that. Okay. Let's see. We have. Work my way through. We'll have Jay White, Tom Lozon, uh, there's Alicia. I didn't see you on my list here. Alicia Feeler, and I think that's it. Okay. And is there anyone else to be heard on this application? Okay. In that case, um, I will swear you in. Um, Please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes. Okay. Thank because you all. You can't see them. Um, a lot of nodding heads. Not a lot of nodding heads. Thank you for the translation. Um, and I'm sorry for this inconvenience. My next effort will be to try and join on iPad, um, but we'll see how this goes. So, um, Mike, in this circumstance, are you, would you like to provide an overview or like the last application, would you like to um, have the applicant present that? Uh, I think I will let the applicant deal with that. I've reviewed the applications and I've read the staff reports, but I don't think I can summarize the application as well as Alicia probably could. So I'll let her okay. take care of that. That's very good. So in that case, um, Alicia, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, let me get my, uh, everybody can see my, my screen at this point? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so down along the bottom of the page is State Street. Um, this is the parcel 99 uh, State Street. We are proposing to have some changes to the, um, sorry, the site and then also to the actual architecture of the building, which has gone through the design review committee um, meeting a couple week at, weeks ago. So the changes to the site plan are proposed to be um, a removal of an existing ATM kiosk located here, um, and then a inclusion or kind of reinstatement of a teller window um, here. So there 
currently is a structure for that that bumps out on the building, um, and it hasn't been in use for a, over a few years. Um, and so we're looking to remove this kiosk and slide the kind of drive-through component forward to have it at the teller window. Um, so with that, we are um, adjusting the curb width uh, where it's located re reflect, um, relative to the actual building space. So it just gets a, it's a, a little closer, um, the way the, the drawer kind of opens up for the teller window. The overhang of the drive-throughs of the same exact piece with the same etching of their Community National Bank logo and the name. Um, similarly, we are proposing a sign over the Vermont federal sign on the front of the uh, buildings. There's currently etched in granite Vermont federal, and that's not what's going to be in there. So we're proposing to have a stainless steel plaque sign over that um, so that it could be reversed at uh, a future date and remains that historical nature of the existing sign along that front. Um, that, that's a that's the general overview. Um, I'm more than happy to answer questions now or as the, the meeting proceeds. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, Lisa. Um, are there, as, as we start off, are there any general questions from BRB members about what was just presented? Uh, verifications, verifications on the scope of the project. project. And, and um, I, I, I would invite you to just type up because I'm, I'm still having trouble getting, getting on to the, to the Zoom. Zoom. Uh, this, this is Alicia again. I want to clarify to change of use currently is it's an existing office building, building, so we are changing use to bank use as, as well as having that initial use drive through. I didn't specifically say that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, before, before we get into it, one thing I want to understand about the site, and um, forgive me if you've explained this just now, I was a little distracted with the, with the zooming. Um, but this will come up more later, but just as part of the overview. Um, my, my understanding is that there's a, a proposal to raise the elevation of the area next to the drive through by 10 inches. And you may have just shown this on the picture that I was unable to see, so again, I apologize. But, but could, could you clarify what that looks like and how it relates to the, the, the overall space that we, that we know is a shared area for 107 and, and others? Certainly. So, so um, yes, we are proposing to raise the elevation at the um, face of the building. Um, and we have uh, we managed to get that to eight inches. We, we originally had a different um, kind of Count height inside the building, and Jay was able to work with me and, and really uh, go through a thorough analysis of what is a comfort level um, for the, the teller box and, and whatnot. Um, because we need comfort on the inside of the building and on the outside for the customer coming to the window. So we, we managed to get it to eight inches of elevation change, um, but then it, it flares back down to the existing pavement elevations all along the property line, certainly we're not crossing the main property line. Um, and then also, at kind of, this is our kind of stopping point up at the northern side of the site and then down here on the southern um, portion, um, which is still over 40 feet from the sidewalk um, where along State Street. Um, and it did make a little cross-section for the reference and everybody's Information. So this is the existing. Alicia, um, we're not, we're not seeing your uh, screen, screen share, so you, you need to pop that up. Thank you. I'm, I'm so, so sorry. sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Um, apologies. So this is the cross section that is of the um, existing. Here's the property over here on this side would be the 105 State Street property, and then this is the property line here. This is the edge of the right of way line, which is 10 and a half feet. And then over here is where our building face is. This is the restored um, roof that is being proposed. Now there's a flat face to the exterior of the building instead of having the bump out that's currently there. We've moved the curb in 
um, because yes, that drawer box doesn't require the curb being so far out. And, and so the proposed elevation change, just to give you an idea, in this, this dotted existing grade it is over 6%, six percent, it's about six and a half percent in this area. And, and so we are increasing it um, some, and we definitely take note of that. And, and so that's why we were, we were trying the best um, to minimize how much elevation change there was in that in that area. So, so there's, there's no, um, you know, curved over here. here. People, People can still, still use this, this. Um, both in and, and out of 107 and 105. Uh, 105 would just be out. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I, 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 I think, think that, unfortunately, I wasn't able to see it, but um, I, I'm glad others are seeing it because I know a lot more about it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm on the phone and restarting my computer more than, than you want to know, but that's, that's where, where I am. am. Um, so, so at this point, point um, I think, think what would be best is, is if we um, heard from Mr. Lozon, who's here to, to comment on this application. Um, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Let me pause there. there. Um, is, is there is this, this an appropriate time to hear from, from Jay, Jay as, as well, or should can we wait, wait, wait until we get to the design piece? I'm doing high level to start. Jay, Jay would you mind waiting until we do design? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the design is very straightforward. It got very good reviews. The design review meeting um, is basically restoring what's there. I think the signs are sensitive to what's there. And I don't think there's really any issue regarding the design. I'm happy to talk, talk about them, but I think you've seen the uh, drawings, and I don't think there's any issues with the design. Uh, if there's issues with the site, then you can, can continue with that first and come back to the design if that's easier for everyone. Okay, okay, well, I think what we'll do is maybe tap into your expertise so we um, reach the site plan more, more, more PC and in more detail. But um, just, just for the sake of general overviews and expression of uh, information, I would like to um, invite Mr. Lozon to speak next um, to take a few minutes. Um, we've received your memo today, um, and uh, like you're, you're welcome to go ahead and present that now. Okay, um, thank, thank you very much. Can everyone uh, hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, okay. Um, and uh, Mr. Moe, I have to apologize. I'm not very uh, technically proficient. Is, is there any way you can put my memo on the screen and I'll simply run, run through it? Could you screen share that with us? That was a PDF. And I want to explain to you the timing um, because I know we're all very busy. I didn't mean to get the deal late this afternoon, but what happened was. Um, the packet was on the web page, the city's web page on Thursday, and I didn't realize that um, Meredith was going to need to take the packet down on Friday. So I had planned on working on my comments on Friday, but when I went to access the packet, it wasn't there because uh, Meredith is adding some information. So I was only able to access it on Saturday and then couldn't arrange a site visit until today. So, so, so the only issues that I have, I've got an issue with the third stacking space. Um, as you can see, that's my vehicle uh, parked in uh, the first parking space as you're moving back away from State Street, the first parking space. And when I took the picture, I want you to just note the location of my vehicle. I, I typically park about a foot from the curb. Um, take a good representative picture. And, and, and use the right perspective. So if you see where the little doghouse is sort of in the center that, that protrudes, uh, that's the doghouse that's over the existing um, that's over the existing color window. And I believe they're they're proposing uh, to replicate uh, that doghouse and, and it would just shift down the building. So, so that's actually the edge of the building. The the, the brickwork that you see. Uh, that protrudes out a little bit more. That's, that's actually the ATM that's going to be eliminated. And then, and then where the, the so, so moving to the second red line, second to your right, uh, it's where the right way starts. And, uh, you know, I would point out that um, this, this project seems to propose work in, in an area in a right of way that we have legal. Uh, Rights to that, that we have deeded rights to that we have property rights to, and we're not a party to this application. And uh, this wasn't discussed with us before uh, before we saw it here. So, if you could move that down to the next picture, Mr. Miller, that would be great. 
He moved it. Yeah, there you go. A little bit more. <laughs> a little bit more. A little bit more. Uh, sorry. Go to this one. Uh, yeah, that one's that one's fine. Actually, I can go. I can do the the narrative on that. Um, no, the yeah. I mean, that one's fine. I think you might have moved a little bit down and and skipped a picture. I apologize. I just oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So that's just a better picture of you know the side of the building. And so if you were looking, if you look at where the, the red arrow on the left is, that's actually, that line is depicting where the parking area is. It's rather faded, uh, but it's there. So that's where the rear of a vehicle would be. And the uh, second arrow to the right, that's again, the start of the right of way. And that yellow line, uh, th that's a distance of approximately seven feet. So it would be difficult for uh, you know, again, we just have concerns with that third uh, stacking area because if there were a vehicle at the drive-through and occupying the second stacking space, uh, a vehicle simply, and there was a vehicle parked in that first parking space, a vehicle simply wouldn't be able to queue up properly in the third space without being at somewhat of an angle. And by being at an angle, the angle, they'd be encroaching uh, on the right-of-way. They just, the third space, simply wouldn't function if there's a vehicle parked in that first space and, and two vehicles occupying the teller lane. So if you could move down, please, Mr. Miller. Yeah, you're doing great. Yeah, that's that's perfect. And I just wanted you, you know, to notice, uh, you know, again, looking at the angles, we didn't put, if you look at that site visually, um, when we place the Jersey barriers, we place them well away from, you know, the right of way line because we didn't want to encroach on it, wanted to leave uh, plenty of room for people. So in fact, the, the right of way, a lot of people think the right of way is depicted or our property rights are depicted by the Jersey barriers. They're not, those are, are well back uh, from the right of way line, which actually is painted uh, on the site. So you can see you know, where the right of way starts uh, on the left hand side, left arrow, and where it ends with the right arrow. And you can also note, um, you know, you can note there how significant the grade is. The grade from uh, 99 State Street, uh, you can see that's a fairly significant grade. And so, you know, again, we have concerns about uh, filling and adding to the steepness of that grade. When we presented this memo to uh, Meredith, she forwarded it to Tom McArdle, and uh, Tom McArdle's response was, I missed that. This is going to affect uh, stormwater runoff. You know, the stormwater comes off the roof in from the teller lane, and he noted that it was going to affect stormwater runoff. And, and again, not to paraphrase, it's what he said in his memo. We missed that in our review. Uh, so I think, I believe, Mr. Mello, I think that's our last picture. Oh, no, there's one more, actually if you wouldn't mind. Almost, yeah, perfect. So that's the existing teller window. Um, so again, and I wanna say we're very supportive of this project. Um, you know, Pat does a good job with his buildings. I think it's very, very well done. Uh, as we were planning our project, I'd look at that building and I thought it was sad how it had been allowed to deteriorate and we would place that on how long the windows would actually stay in the sash. Uh, fortunately, they made it until Pat bought the building. So I think they're going to do a great job. So we are supportive of the project in general, but I just point out that all of the change in grade, which is going to affect stormwater, which is going to uh, affect because the, the change in grade and what the applicant is proposing goes beyond the right of way. It goes into the right of ways, proposing to change the grade of property that others have rights to um, and change it in a way that's going to have adverse effects on our property. So again, all of this could be eliminated. That is the existing teller window. You can see the drawer is at driver door height. And I, I don't have a high vehicle. I have a rather low vehicle. So, you know, if that teller drawer can, can service my vehicle, uh, I think the, the natural uh, or logical approach would be simply avoid the fill 
and move maintain that window height when the window is relocated. And I, I see, you know, you, you talked a little bit in the presentation. I know you wanted to talk, Jay. In the presentation, you talked about convenience, convenience of the uh, customer, convenience of the teller. Um, however, that you also have to consider the convenience of the neighbors and the fact that uh, by changing this grade, you're gonna significantly impact. And you can see the steepness of the grade just in how my car is sitting. You can see that's a fairly steep grade now and they're proposing to increase it. Uh, so again, uh, as long as that third stacking space can be addressed and the grade or elimination of the change in grade can be addressed, we're fully supportive of this project. Uh, thanks very much, hope it didn't take too long. No, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so what I'd like to do next, uh, uh, yeah, just a second, please, Jay. Um, okay. I, I'm here, and I, I think that my, my phone is not joined with my voice, but you get the idea. Um, so what what I'd like to do next, since this is, this is kind of a big issue, it touches upon um, stormwater as well as um, site uh, uh, circulation issues. Um, I would like to have a little bit of back and forth on this now um, while it's all fresh in our mind rather than waiting until we get to that point in the staff report. And so, um, so yes, I just wanted to provide that little overview. Jay, um, please go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, it might be helpful to either have Alicia's plan back up or the or the photograph that uh, was just up recently might be helpful, Mike, if you can put that one back up that shows the window. Okay, now Tom said there's a drawer. What you're looking at there is not the drawer. That's the remains of a pneumatic tube system. Uh, and that is actually a drop box that is being removed. That's not going to be there. The window that's going to be put in doesn't protrude outward of the building. It actually is flush with the building. So that allows us to move the curb closer to the building, which reduces the uh, overall height and slope. And I think if you look at Elisha's civil engineering plans, they actually show it better as far as what the right of way is and what the driveway is. But uh, what we uh, are proposing is leaving the roof where it is, but restoring it, it needs to be repaired and moving away the existing window that you see there and putting in a new modern window that does not require a, uh, a pneumatic tube. The ATM that is going to be in, uh, that's been removed from the uh, little kiosk building that is in kind of front of this spot. That's being removed, so that allows the curb also to be straight back. And it also, uh, the ATM is going to be accessed on the pedestrian side of the building, which is the other side of the building, as well a night drop box. And so what Tom says, the drawer is there. It's not a drawer, Tom. That is a drop box that's being removed. And also, I think, Tom, you parked your car quite a ways away. If a person was actually using that window, they would be much closer to the curb than what you're showing. So I think if we go back to Alicia, if you can share your screen and show the site plan again, I think that would clarify that there is enough width to do basically what's been done for, for years. If, um, if you go to the overall site plan, you see the parking is really the same parking that's been there. We're improving that because we're no longer having to have cars stop at the ATM machine and perhaps block access to the drive through teller machine. So there's only one machine on this side of the building now. And I think the uh, grade that Alicia has there on the right hand there, if you can kind of show in there, you know, there you can see the, the existing grade surveyed by the engineers, the dash line. The other line is just slightly higher and the curb that you see is there is we're, we're putting a six inch curb there, but we're not putting the curb against the brick wall because we want to not bury the brick wall. But the driveway, I think, works perfectly well, all within the normal standards of uh, the um, driveway, because the right-of-way is actually a lane over from where the drive through is. So I think that it's it's better to look at the site plan as opposed to perspective uh, photographs. And I think, Tom, you, you, I think I've noticed when you park in front of uh, your, your building in Barry City Hall, you park much closer to the curb than what you park at this site. But I think that drivers can park all the way in and as they have for years, you can get around the, uh, the uh, tail end of the cars that are parked on the diagonal uh, spaces that are already there. So I think that it actually is a, an improvement to the overall flow of the traffic. As, uh, and I think the other very important thing to notice is that this, the site plan that was submitted 
by uh, Mr. Lozon's uh, civil engineer did not show the existing drainage that Tom and Carl suggested could be added in the park in the flush in the flush parking lot. It's already there. And I think that uh, the grade changes here, as you can see, the leaches, uh, civil engineering drawings, do not go into any additional fill on the property line of the neighbor. So as long as the survey is correct, which ours is certified, I don't, I don't know that uh, Mr. Lozon's is certified because it did not show an existing major uh, storm drain, which is where the, a lot of this water would drop, go to. It doesn't all drain down the right of way. And Tom McCardle was suggesting that perhaps it could be added to not drain down the right of way. It's already there. It just is not shown on the Lozon site plan, which, and I think it should have been. Can you show us where that is on this site plan? Yeah, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take it if you don't mind, Jay. Um, so yeah. the site plan the site plan that I submitted as well had a missing structure on it in error. So it was not just Mr. Lozon's plan. I will take um, admit that I did exclude by accident the drainage structure located here. It is on our property, the 99 State Street property. It is a catch basin, so it will let water in, and it is generally in the, the low spot of the site. Now, uh, you can see my screen, is that correct? Uh, yes, okay. Um, uh, there is also, I have a, a photo to share that, um, that shows, here's the catch basin, um, and I, I just, it was oversight on my original submission. It has been included in the plan now. It is in the, generally the low spot. However, you may see that there's also a pothole that's lower right now, which would be fixed. Um, to allow water to drain properly to that structure. Um, I did check to see if the, the grades on our site were going to pond substantially or um, create an excess of stormwater now draining to the structure on Mr. Lozon's property um, that's located closer to State Street, and they're proposing a little bit of work on that one. I did not include the, the proposed work. It sh shifted the catch basin and... Um, made sure to match their new their new height. Um, so the water is draining from my arrow down here. Um, it's a shallow slope, but it is still draining all the way in this direction towards this catch basin, excluding the, there's a few, you know, um, kind of anomaly spots of potholes and, and such in, in this area where it gets really, really shallow and we'd be, um, We'd love to work with, um, I never did see a, a grading plan from this proposed um, project, but I assume they were meeting existing elevations along the property line, as it's kind of generally understood. Um, and so we're, we're proposing to do the same thing to match existing property line. Um, and then also I wanted to show this partial, oops, this partial plan to try to alleviate some of the concern with the the parking space. Um, so if this this is the the ten and a half foot right of way, this is the edge here, and um, Tom mentioned a seven foot uh, width approximately, and I can understand it's it's pretty hard to measure, and perspectives of photos are sometimes um, can be miscued. So anyway, I I've, I've drawn a line here that's seven feet. When I ended up measuring it on my plan, it ended up being seven and a half. But this is the seven foot line, and this is kind of the projection of the back of that parking space here, or the side, which would end here if it was a squared off space. So the vehicle maneuvering uh, from the common right of way this direction comes around. Um, if those, if there are cars, which several times in the day there might not be, but oftentimes there may. Um, those cars, this car could maneuver in the right of way, which we're allowed to do, and I think everybody agrees to that. Um, and then they can maneuver back into this parking space, excuse me, stacking space, um, and that allows us to have one service space and two stacking spaces. Um, there haven't, we don't feel that there's a need for a third stacking space, just based on some different information and, and um, different projects in the area and different um, existing banks in the area. So we feel like that that is an adequate amount, the one service and the two stacking spaces. Um, and so that it, it's close. I, I could have finessed the, the model a little bit better to make it even further, but that's not what we're trying to do. It does get that car into the space, into the stacking space as we've shown it. Um, 
Uh, I also got the information from Tom McCardle. Let me just grab that real quick. Um, so I, I agree. He, he absolutely said that he missed that there was a grade change. Um, and I think the, the main source of confusion was the lack of the catch basin shown on, on the plan that the water um, that is coming off of our now higher elevated site will, will need to make it to this catch basin, which it will. Um, and it, that wasn't shown before. So there is an area for it to collect. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about how much water the catch basin um, that uh, is further towards State Street is going to collect. That's, I mean, we're not going to, we're not proposing any changes to it. It's not on our property. It's kind of um, out of our hands on that one. But so Mr. McCardle mentioned um, that a possible remedy to the drainage flow problem may be to add a new drain westerly of the existing drain with a room elevation to catch the water. And so I think the when the plan showed a just rim as necessary, this is the drain manhole, so it's a solid drain cover as a, ju as a junction from multiple pipes. The actual inlet is here. So we just wanted to make sure that somebody didn't bump their car over this manhole or, or go into a big pothole because we're changing the elevations. We want to adjust that rim to, to have a smooth site, um, and that's why that note, adjust rim as necessary, is here. We aren't proposing changes to this as it falls in the corner of our proposed area um, of, of change. So that's supposed to be existing and stay there. Okay. Um, so at, at this point, if I may, um, I'd like to pause and see if DRB members have some questions or clarifications. I'm glad that we've dived right in. Um, they're talking about substance. Um, I can see you now. I'm on an iPad, so I'm gazing off into the distance. Just, just thank you for bearing with me. Um, Questions from DRB members. Uh, do, do you have a, a number for that um, that stacking lane as it currently exists? It seems like you'll be moving that closer to the building. Do you have an exact uh, you know measurement on how much closer the car will be able to go to the building? For instance, maybe a distance from the edge of the right of way to uh, you know the, the closest point at which the car can pull into the building. Sure. Um, so the, let me just grab it then. There's, there's, the curb has been slid a distance of, sorry, lots of clicking. Um, over one foot, the curb has moved closer to our building um, while still remaining with a gap between behind the curb, like Jay mentioned, to um, protect the existing base brick facade. Um, and face. So that curbing has slid over an extra, over a foot. It was about um, 11, sorry, 13 inches. And so does that translate to an extra foot of the travel way of the, uh, the right away? Other question. Yes. It, it's an extra foot of drive through space. The common right of way only is ever 10 and a half feet wide. I have a question about the uh, slope. Um, are there any recommendations or standards as far as slopes within a parking lot in Vermont that you know of? Um, flatter is better, except not too flat so you don't pond. So that's, that's, I mean, there's, there's no, um, I was unable because I did a, a lot of searching because I was um, wanting to make sure we had a, a well-designed site. So there's some information on parking garages, on what side slopes, you know, because it's not a vertical slope. You're not driving up and down it like a um, traditional travel way. It's across the slope, which is getting steeper. Um, so I was trying to look into that. So I looked at a lot of different areas around Montpelier just to see how how do things work in Montpelier already? Are there cross slopes? Are there you know where where cars are moving around corners? How steep do things get? So um, for a, just for a reference, I don't. It's unrelated to our site completely, other than I just wanted to use it for reference. Um, when you're turning from Berry Street onto Sibley Ave, so everybody knows, if you've been there, you know that it's like 
a, a reverse curve almost, um, and it, that's a 16% turn. So that's not at all what we're losing. Um, we're down to the 10. It's still more than a, a normal street that's a cross slope of two to five percent, um, but it is it's a, a travelable travelable um, slope. Um, and and not unheard of. There's several other areas in the in the city that are um, steep, and I'm not aware of issues with them. But that doesn't mean um, that they, they don't exist. But I didn't. Tom McCardle didn't necessarily. You know, the, the spot elevations are there. Um, he didn't necessarily say that he was concerned with the slope. It was more just that where is the stormwater going to go? Um, and I think that that concern could be uh, just alleviated um, with seeing that. That catch basin. Yeah, thank you. Could, could you just point one more time um, on the north side going towards the catch basin of where, uh, you know, the approximate, like, limits of your filling for the raised grade will be? So this here. Oh, okay. This yep. is where we're matching back to existing. Um, and the, what I am, the uh, steepest section is in this course at the teller window component here. Yeah, right. Um, that's, and then it, it, to give you perspective, this is where it, it ties back in here. Thank you. So it's a little difficult to visualize, but there'll basically be a hump there that the car kind of pulls up onto to access the teller window and then it'll be kind of a hump back down to get back into the travel way. I think it's more gradual than a hump. It's slightly higher at the drive through but I don't I wouldn't call it a hump. Go ahead, Alicia. I think I think that's the easiest way to describe it. That yes, it's an elevated surface and it flares down everywhere else. Um, it, it's not necessarily like a um, uh, a pothole that you're bouncing in and out of, or a you know a um, mound, I guess, and that the opposite of a pothole. Um, but it you you slope up and you and then you slope back down and you're on a cross slope. So you kind of um, yeah, it's it's like a, going around a, a banked curve or something like that. That there's a cross slope, but then you're also maneuvering horizontally forward and backward well, forward, hopefully um, across the site. Okay, I guess when you speak to cross slopes on a roadway, uh, I know the Agency of Transportation tries to stick to under 8% on a side slope and the 6% being more preferable, the reason being because of ice. Um, I know it's probably a minor concern, but 10% is pretty steep for a side slope for a car to be on, and there is the potential that in a freezing conditions, like freezing rain or something where the entire surface becomes covered in ice, the car will just slide down that 10% slope. Um, I don't know for a fact that that would happen. I'm just stating that it does concern me. The 10% slope concerns me a little bit. Understood. Um, and, and that's why we really, um, it was a little bit steeper before, and we really tried to push the limits of the, um, usability uh, to, the, to this minimum, minimal slope. Um, and I think in, un unfortunately, in, in freezing rain, um, the, the key is, is to have the water move off of the surface. And so when the surface is sloped, the water should be shedding off of the surface and going to those low points. In a freezing rain situation where, um, or, or icing situation where things are going to be slippery faster is on those flat areas that aren't draining. Um, and then if there's already an ice, yes, the steeper, the more likely uh, for a, a sliding 
um, occurrence. Um, I think that the, of course, the agency of transportation is probably working with um, different speeds. You know, I'm, I'm hoping people are, are driving cautiously through an area where there's uh, three different properties using it and being aware of their surroundings. Um, freezing rain, stay home, don't go to the bank. But um, people will kind of always do things. Um, so that's, that was a consideration. You know, I think also that's as steep as most of it is less steep. It gets down to nothing again. So it's just the steepest part right where the drive up is. And there's only one. Right, thank you. Yeah, it's um, the, the steep section that we're calling is, is the length of one car. So, uh, you know, as that or, or 20 feet or so. So um, as you're getting off of it, uh, a half a second later, you're, getting, you're coming back off of it. So, Kate, are you still with us? Okay, so it appears that uh, uh, Kate's uh, technical issues have, have uh, reappeared. Kevin, you're the vice chair. I'm the vice chair. Um, I, I need to get oriented here a bit, so I'm going to call for a uh, for a, a three minute uh, recess, uh, so we can uh, get back on track. Let's see if we can track down Kate. She might be coming back in. She's under VNRC now. Okay. Wonder if yeah, she went to work. Comes. Here she comes. Well, while we have a quick break, do, Alicia, do I have the, the copies of what you just presented, or does that have to get sent to Meredith for the files? I will send to Meredith for the files, okay. certainly. Perfect. I already have Tom, so that's good. I got Welcome back. Thank you. That was inconvenient for everybody, and I apologize. And I will acknowledge that I'm signing on on my work computer, um, but I'm, it said the NRC, but I'm, I'm here as Kate McCarthy, citizen of Montpelier. So, um, Kevin, why don't you um, take it to the next step or finish whatever thought you were um, guiding, and then I can. Uh, we, we, were in we were in between. We were just finishing up with the, with the testimony from uh, the applicant. And uh, so we didn't really skip a beat. We took a break for three minutes and you're back. And uh, uh, I'm going to pass the baton back to you, Kate. Magical. Thank you all for your adaptability. Welcome, welcome to my dining area. Um, so what I would like to do next is um, start on the staff report. The first item on the staff report has to do with the recommendations of the design review committee. Um, we're just gonna go in that order. And from what I see, um, I'm gonna have to pull up my notes as we're talking. The um, design review recommendations involve um, rust, I think rust free, I'm sorry, Jay, could you summarize the design review recommendations? For me, I know that's not typical, but I would appreciate your help. Um, the design review, I, the design review recommendations had an approval of every issue on the list. There, uh, they liked everything that we we're proposing. So I think mainly what they liked is we're basically proposing to restore the exterior of the building to its original um, conditions, uh, with the exception of this replacement of this one old drive-through window with a new drive-through window. We are okay. pointing the uh, bricks, uh, we are painting all of the woodwork, we are replacing two uh, rotted windows with two brand new windows to match exactly. They're still single pane windows with the same size buttons as everywhere else has. 
Um, we have an option to add historic shutters that we're researching what they would look like. We think that they may have been operable, at least in the lower portion of it. Um, that's an option that we can or can't do. We didn't want to make that a requirement and the and design review committee did not require that we put on shutters, but Pat Malone would like to consider putting shutters on the building. Um, we have located all of the uh, mechanical heat pump system um, um, on the roof of the lower section where it's not visible. They like that feature very much because we're not adding anything into the yard area. They also like that we are maintaining the flood uh, control measures that were already in the building when Pat uh, purchased it. That was mainly a concrete block wall that sat inside of the existing original historic stone walls. There was a kind of an 18 inch space between the concrete block wall and the stone wall. And that was set up for flood uh, control and also all of the exterior openings that you normally have in a historic building in the basement level had already been filled in. So there's no uh, flood issues that we would need to worry about. Plus, Eric Gilbertson uh, wrote a very strong letter uh, confirming that the building is and is a very strong candidate for the National Red, uh, Register contributing structure, and it will be more so contributing when it's restored. Um, Wonderful. And I think okay. the, uh, the advantage of, uh, of the project going ahead is that it really is an improvement for the city of Montpelier, and it's, it was a bank before, we're making it a bank again, and we're improving, the, instead of having both pedestrian and three things to access on the, um, I guess it'd be the uh, west side of the building, we only have the teller window where it is now, and we're moving the, uh, the uh, ATM uh, and the uh, night deposit box over on the pedestrian side of the building. And that's good. Uh, good. We, heard, we heard about that a little bit earlier. Um, um, sure. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry to, I, I, I think that, um, I, I'm sorry to cut you off, but in, in the interest of time, I want to say that I think it, it, it sounds like it's very compatible. It's wonderful to hear the design review committee is favorable. Um, one of the recommendations of the design review committee pertains to tree care um, and the, that recommendation is as well as the option to do the shutters are, are ones that we will likely um, include and I assume there's no no objection to either of those is that is that correct I just um, the there isn't an objection um, uh, the owner did not care for just the wording about the tree uh, component um, on the recommendation form so he didn't sign that one he's he wants to just make sure that everybody knows we know that those trees are not in the best of health and we're going to get an arborist to um, evaluate them we'd like the ability to have the arborist help us in decision making for um, options for the tree but certainly limiting and minimizing um, hazards of the tree um, is is a very key crucial part of this project so the, the wording okay. in the recommendation wasn't quite what he wanted. But he did sign the, the sign recommendation form. Okay, and is that is the objection to the wording that it calls for, I think it calls for like historically appropriate trees, is that a limitation that he wants to avoid? Uh, no, uh, the, it, was just, it was just that they indicated if at any point these trees are deemed to be in poor health and no longer an asset, they may be removed. So we already know that they're in poor health and we're we're not asking to be removed it was just a little bit vague a little bit amb ambiguous um we're already evaluating them we do want the ability to remove them if we need to for safety but um we want to go through the proper saving the tree if we can okay. well, all right we'll take that into account when we get to that point kevin yeah i was just gonna what ask you, what what, what uh, type of trees are they currently Norway Naples. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, good. Thank you. I think that that gets us through the design review portion here. Um, what I'd like to do next is have a look at the general stand. We're just going to walk through the staff report. We we tackled one of the big parts of the discussion. We'll we'll return to that um, as we go through. But um, if if it's okay with everybody, and I'm diving back in, um, we'll just go through the staff report. Is that okay? That's good here. DRB members, thank you. 
All right, so um, as you recall, what we're looking at here, the, these uses are allowed, so the change of use isn't, isn't really under, great, isn't under scrutiny. It is the drive-through that is a conditional use in this right. district, as we are aware. Um, the dimensional standards uh, appear to be appear to be met. Um, the removal of the the bump out ATM is not it's not part of the original listing in historic places, so we're we're okay there. Um, we comply with the general standards. Um, we've discussed um, we have not discussed erosion control, but as as is standard, um, we want to confirm that. The applicant will comply with those erosion control practices of 3008D. Is that the case? As best as they, um, as appropriate on a small site, yes. As appropriate on a small site. Okay, very good. Um, and then stormwater management, we talked a little bit about. Um, it's possible that um, one of the reasons that Tom McCardle was unsure what to conclude about stormwater in light of the proposed grade change was that um, the the cash basin was not on the plan. We've since discussed where it would be on the plan, and it it seems to clear up some of those questions. Do any um, you know? My my thought there is that if DPW signs off on stormwater, this section could be found to be met. But before before I conclude that on my own, do DRB members want to talk? Need any more evidence uh, about stormwater on this site? Not here. Okay. Hey. I just, I just, I think I, at some point I wanted to sort of flag an issue here, and um, I don't know where appropriate is to do it. Um, we've got two sites. We've got they're both uh, currently being engineered, um, and we have, you know, I think as Joe mentioned, we have some very, you know, steep grades. Um, and uh, uh, maybe I just want to reiterate that I don't think it's the place of the DRB to be deciding what can and cannot happen within a, you know, a deeded, you know, right away. Um, very much would encourage that be worked out um, between the two, you know, landowners, especially because you know engineering uh, doesn't stop at the property lines; they have to have to meet together. Um, and so, I don't think we're going to be able to finish uh, everything tonight, and would encourage um, that type of collaboration um, uh, between now and our next hearing. So, um, maybe that's already happening, but I just wanted to reiterate that. If I thank may, you, thank you for that, and. We're, we welcome a call. Sounds good. Thank you all. Um, anything else from DRB members on stormwater? All right. Um, moving right along, um, we move into access and circulation, section 3010. Um, and we have talked about the fact that the, the new ATM, the new drive through, it's not an ATM, the new drive through teller window is going to be about 10 feet closer to the street than the current one is. We've talked about ingress and egress no, for 107 no, as well. No, the, the teller window is exactly where it is now. The ATM is being removed and the ATM is going to be on the other side of the building. We're not moving the little roof where the teller window is. It's still going to be the same location. It's just a different window. Okay. Okay, so what I'm looking at is um, in our staff report on page nine, where it says the only significant change is that instead of drive up bank customers stopping at the existing ATM kiosk, they will stop roughly 10 feet closer to the egress for 105 State. Um, I'm not sure what that's referring to. Maybe what it's saying no. is that. I, I think they may have thought that the ATM was being moved up to there, and it is not. Okay, I, I understand. Um, I understand that. The ATM okay. has been moved over to the other side of the building as a pedestrian only ATM. We don't okay. want that, that to makes sense. walk up to the side yeah. of the building. On the okay, side. yeah, it's, it, the, the staff Thank report's you. a little uncertain on that. Okay, I was going with the red highlights in the staff report. I, I've got enough clarification on that. If others do too, we'll roll along. Good to go. Sounds a lot like rushing, but I do intend to be thorough, so do stop me as, as you did. Um, so, um, Another highlight from our staff report is that signage about um, how to navigate through that um, drive-through is not indicated on the plan. Is there a um, plan for signage to direct customers of this bank to the to the new new window or the, the old window in the new configuration? Right. We had um, we hadn't proposed any signage. Um, the the site flows counterclockwise currently. 
um, and has historically for many years, um, the diagonal parking already is there. So we didn't necessarily have a um, sign that said drive through, come in this entrance or anything like that. Um, I think uh, for whatever reasons, it seems like it's been, it's been functioning quite well. Um, and if somebody were to go the opposite direction, they would just notice that they couldn't access the drive through and they'd have to come back around in the other opposite direction because there is an ability uh, in theory to two way traffic on both of those common right of ways. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, what was the other piece of that? I think that's, um, so then the other was that we were gonna put drive through um, paint on the, on the drive through lane and a white stripe along the right of way to, to focus people into the lane against the building to not have people um, kind of floating around in the right of way. Okay. Um, CRB members, does that, does a painted lane that you're basically indicating the directionality of use, it, the direction you go in order to use the, um, the teller window, so the, there'll be an arrow painted on or something like that? Right, okay. similar to if you're in a um, restaurant drive through, there's stay in this. Okay, great. I think that satisfies the concern as I see it. So we're moving on to page 10 of the staff report. Uh, emergency vehicle access street improvements are found to be adequate. Um, we talked about signage um, and ensuring that we're managing flow within the site as, as well as, as can be. Um, are there any DRB questions about site circulation, management of traffic in the site, directional signs? I have a quick question about where they park at the, the window. Is there... Okay, Joe, yeah. It, it's a little difficult to tell. It looks like it's close. Is there sight distance from the driver's side window, you know, down that road, or does the building cut it off? Mm -hmm. Uh, there is, um, let me see if I can, um, yeah, I guess the building doesn't really come out that far, does it? Right. So, you know, this would be the, the driver would be sitting roughly here looking through the windshield, um, and the building corner, outermost corner is here. Um, and so there's, I, I would, I would say that they could see the entire opening here and certainly that um I, I think that they can visibly see it around that corner to the street okay thanks any other yeah, I, member I, questions? I agree, I agree, you know. uh, yeah they're right all right okay i'm gonna continue um, parking and loading areas are not applicable. We're not seeing any changes. Um, we talked a little bit about signs, um, and they are within range of what is acceptable within our um, requirements. So that brings us to the bottom of page 11 of the staff report, which is special use standards. The special use we're contemplating here is the drive-through. Um, the stacking lanes um, are located to the side of the building as required. We've talked about how they will be, um, will, will the stacking lanes themselves be signed, marked, and separated from travel lanes? The, the idea would be to have the paint marking designate that, um, designate those spaces as separate from the maneuvering space of the common right of way. Okay, thank you. Um, we talked about signage to direct teller users. Um, some of these other standards are not applicable because of the location of the stacking relative to the building. Um, can you confirm that those spaces are 18 feet long by 9 feet wide? Yes. Thank you. Um, so then the other thing to consider, um, we're, we're familiar with this part of the of the um, the specific use standards is um, we we want to confirm whether we want to understand whether it is the drive through is located a sufficient distance from property lines and screens to prevent adverse impacts, including but not limited to noise and light trespass on adjacent property. So, could you offer testimony on how 
um, those impacts from the from the teller window will be managed or mitigated. Um, yes. So the the um, light from the the actual window. There's a, a proposed overhead light underneath the underside of the roof overhang. Um, uh, that's the only lit component during the evening hours when um, outside of business hours, I should say. Um, obviously, it gets dark earlier. Um, the kiosk that was previously used was in operation 24 seven. Um, and this teller window will only be in operation during open business hours. Um, so we feel like that the, the light kind of associated with it will be um, comparable or less. The um, noise, you know, in the in the area, it's a downtown area. There's there's going to be noises. Um, we don't think it's outside of the level of any of the other um, abutting properties and and similar businesses. Okay, thank you. I, I might just um, add the um, can it add one thing to what we just said the light that we are putting over the exist or under the ceiling of the existing roof. Is a small LED light, so it just shines down. The current light is a larger sodium light that basically floods the whole area. We just want to concentrate okay. it right over the teller window. Great, thank you. Um, any questions from board members about this standard? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so we're moving on to site plan standards. We beginning on page 12 of our staff report. We know this is a minor site plan that we are reviewing and approving or reviewing for approval, I should say. Um, so bike and pedestrian access, you, you told us that there will be an ATM, uh, I'm sorry, a pedestrian accessible ATM and night drop box. Um, and those are accessed by a sidewalk to those to those features? Both a sidewalk and a ramp, so they're handicapped accessible, but they are Great. not in where the driveway is. They're okay. at the public entrance and, from the parking lot. Okay. And not required, but always a point of curiosity, is any bike parking being proposed? None is being proposed. Okay. Um, any questions about this from the um, board members? Okay, so that brings us to landscaping and screening. We've talked about the trees. Um, we would like to know a little bit about how, um, where the rubbish will be stored and how that will be screened. The previous um, use in used the exterior dumpster bin that's located on 107's property. They had a shared agreement for that usage. Um, currently, they haven't necessarily negotiated any such um, usage, uh, but it's intended to have tote, tote type um, waste containers inside the building. Um, we aren't proposing any new dumpsters on our uh, portion par parcel. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so one of the main outstanding questions about landscaping was how that would screen the refuse, store, refuse storage. And what I'm hearing you say is that the wheelie bins will be inside the building or inside a shed or something like that. Do, do others have questions about this, um, these sections? CRB members. Okay. Um, outdoor lighting, we've talked a little bit about that. Um, we, we, we do need, um, we, we know that it's very, very likely that these lights will not exceed the maximum allowable for the parcel, but the suggestion of our staff, Meredith, is that we receive um, a diagram showing the total lumen output for all lights on the parcel. The the, um, ex the exterior lights uh, that, that are being you know on the outside of the building are those little five inch by five inch by inch and a half LED lights. 
And then that specification is actually submitted as part of the architectural drawings. Okay. And, um, and then the other light that's on the front of the building is an existing lantern that has two candelabra lights in it. And we would just clean that and replace those little candelabra lights with, with new ones that aren't burnt out. And uh, okay. all of that was approved by the design review committee when they also had the same question on lighting. And we are, there are okay. existing pole lights in the back that we are just keeping as they are. And all of the lighting okay. is within the 60 watt equivalent and a warm color temperature. Okay. Um, can you come from the board? Or yeah, Alicia, go ahead. Are you asking for a um, like an engineered plan of, of what the lumens are for the existing poles? I mean, we have to take them apart and figure out what light is in there, but um, is are you looking for a lighting plan or just a plan showing where the lights are and what each fixture has? The second thing. Thank you. Um, all right. I, I feel like I'm rushing a little bit, but I also think we're hitting what we need to hit. So board members, tell me if you want, if we need to do something different. Uh, we're nope. the team all effort. Good. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to move into the conditional use standards, which brings us to page 16 of our staff report. Again, the conditional use that we are evaluating is the drive through. It's only the drive through that we're looking at. Um, capacity of community facilities and utilities. This is not going to increase park usage or water usage or um, kids in schools. Um, the next item of conditional use has to do with traffic. And we received testimony that um, there's an estimated 125 vehicle trips per day, 10 a.m. peak, 28 p.m. peak, peak p.m. Um, And it's the um, staff assessment or, or it's the evidence presented is that the trip ends would be created with even without the drive through. So that's a thing about this conditional use. We're not evaluating how many trips the bank would generate. We're evaluating how many trips the drive through would generate and trying to sure. separate, separate those out. Um, there's no request for a traffic study. The only concern expressed by DPW is lack of clear markings and signage, which we've discussed. So the staff recommendation is that um, the city's experts on the matter do not appear to have concerns regarding potentially increased traffic from the drive through and the expected new peak hour trips do not trigger a traffic study. I want to pause and see if this is something that DRB members wish to discuss further. So 10 to 28 trips per hour, AM peak and PM peak respectively. And is PM peak four to five or does it vary by location? Uh, I, I think it's worth noting that the drive through teller is only going to be during business hours. It's no longer going to be a 24 seven access as the current situation had been when there was an ATM there. Mm -hmm. So that would actually reduce the amount of uh, of traffic on that right of way. The, the, the AM peak and PM peak most likely are within those business hours and, and right. contributing to when, when other that things that are business hours, yes. bustling. I believe it's four to, four to six. Four to six. Four to six. Usually the um, it can vary based on area, but it's generally four to six. Okay. Thank you. Um, Anything else on this from DRB members? Okay. So that brings us to character of the area. That's another component of the conditional use review that we look at. We've talked about architectural compatibility um, quite a bit. Um, there are really no changes to yards or lot coverage and landscaping is compatible with the character of the area. Um, Could be argued that the rebuilding of the window improves architectural compatibility. Um, staff points out that it is a shifting of the bank related drive through uses as, com as compared to a completely new use, though my own opinion as one board member is that when things have gone dormant for a while, we, we kind of start over from what's there. 
um, rather than what used to be there and comparing it to that. Um, Kate, I think but, you're correct that it is an improvement because now the window is flush with the building, doesn't protrude forward. And we're going to be repairing the brick wall underneath it, which is now missing. And we will match that and tooth those bricks in to match the rest of the brick wall. So um, okay. the only thing that will protrude beyond the brick wall is the roof, which is as it does now. The rest is right. the there. Thank you. Um, DRB members, thoughts, thoughts on this um, character of the area and the drive through Anything you wish to discuss? Well, I, don't, I mean, I already see this former, a form of a requirement here, but I, I guess I think, uh, you know, from, from what I'm seeing, everything together with these, these two adjoining properties and these two projects is that um, all three properties and the public would greatly benefit from, you know, some clear pedestrian access all the way, all the way through. Um, I don't know if that's something that is required of us, but, um, and I don't know that this new drive through even really um, increases the traffic um, on this lane, but, um, you know, while this, you know, redevelopment of these adjoining parcels is happening, I think that everyone would benefit if that was, uh, you know, something that existed. Well, thank you, Rob. In terms of thinking into the future, I think that's something that we can um, we can hope for, but not mandate. We don't have anything to hang our hat on standards-wise in, in making that request at this point, but I think it's a good observation anyway. Um, Joe, did you want to chime in? No, I'm all set. I thought I heard. Okay. But um, duly do noted, Rob. Thank you. Um, all right, so pause. I'll take a breath. Um, are there any other items, DRB members, that you wish to discuss further or get a better understanding of, get more evidence on in order to contemplate this application and potentially vote on it? Um, I'll, I'll make a special pause for Michael in case you're muted and trying to talk. No, I'm, I'm good. I'm good with the application and the explanation from the applicant. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Um, what's the pleasure of the board? We have the option to deliberate. Um, we have the option to vote now and articulate the conditions as, as, as part of that motion. We also have the option to deliberate in deliberative session, which I offer because I want to make sure we get it right. And um, I know we're um, a, rel a relatively new board and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so if it's a learning opportunity, we can take it if we want. Um, but if we feel this is fairly straightforward um, and there aren't any outstanding questions, then we could proceed with the vote. Do folks have any opinions about that? I guess I'm concerned about the cross grade um, here. Um, that's a concern of mine. And um, my gut feeling is I, I, I would like to give the applicant an opportunity to maybe come up with a solution to make things not so extreme if one exists. Um, but that's just one board member. Thanks, Rob. What are other thoughts? Um, while I share Rob's concern about the side slope, it's not ideal. This is hardly a ideal site, I think, as we all know. Um, and I think after I've been doing a little research here, I think while it's not ideal, it's it's acceptable. There's it's not breaking any rules or anything. But I guess in summary, I, I am ready to vote. Um, are there any diagrams that you want to see related to this again? For example, there was a, no need to put it up yet, but there was a site plan, um, a plan view that showed the current grade and then the where the new grade would be in, in, so that when you're, where, where you encounter it when you're driving through that area. Um, does anyone want to see that again? Does anyone want to see anything else or ask Alicia any more questions? 
I guess the only question I would have is, is, is there an option to lower the teller window, even just a few inches would make a big difference. Let's talk about that. Alicia, could you speak, could you and Jay speak to that, please? Sure. Um, and I, I think I'll, I'll let Jay, since he's, he's the in, inside, um, and it sounded like you had done a whole bunch of figuring on counter height, teller window, the, the drawer, the outside curb, lots and lots of um, number crunching for that. Jay, did yep. you, that was that's as low as we could go. We were pushing it. Yes, the, the issue is that the the height of the, the teller window inside is designed for what's ergonomically correct for most tellers who want the bank people tell me, Frank Servet does this. So if you make the inside too low, then over the day's time, because the teller isn't sitting there, they're basically standing at another station walking over to this one. Uh, they want it at a certain height. And um, the height that we have now is what they have recommended. The exterior, the norm is to make the exterior the same elevation as the interior because that's what they do in most urban areas where there's a bank walk up and a sidewalk and they're the same height. They have agreed certainly that the difference that we propose in our site plan is workable because I walked around to several banks and measured it from the ground up to where you would need to use the uh, teller door. And actually the teller drawer has a front end that folds down. So we've measured to an open drawer situation, the drawer slides out and then the front of the drawer folds forward towards the driver so you can reach forward instead of down in. The uh, one banker told me that that's actually a fairly new feature because it allows the teller to actually watch some notarizing or signing a check where before when it was just a straight drop in drawer, you can't do that. So they could not offer that feature at the drive through. So it's about 30, about 40 inches is what's comfortable for, for uh, uh, doing that access from the outside. So it's that, that gives us the, um, the eight inch difference that we have between the inside and the outside that we're, we're looking at. And when I look across the whole width of the slope and I look at Alicia's diagrams from existing to new, I don't see a significant difference there. It's, um, you know, I suppose that someone could say, well, gee, we, if, and I used it based on uh, my car, which is an Impreza. I think if you had a, you know, taller SUV or a truck, it certainly could go lower than that. But I, we'd like to propose it as it is because it, we think that that trust slope is within the norm for this kind of an activity for the use of this space. And uh, that's what we would like to uh, propose. I don't, that's, so that's what is on the application so that we can, continue with that design. And I do think that it is a workable situation. Certainly if it was not workable, it could be changed in the future, but we'd like to propose it as it is to be the height that we're proposing. Okay, thank you for that explanation. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied that although the situation is an ideal, you've looked into it at least. Yeah, I've looked into it a lot and surveyed about four banks and, and talked to two different bankers about it. So I think that it's, uh, and they have agreed that certainly, although the eight inches is more than what they show on their normal diagrams, they agree that certainly it's worked with that height. Kevin? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I just, if we were going to uh, proceed, I mean, I think I think we're pretty much have the testimony we need uh, to move along. Um, perhaps we could discuss what uh, conditions we would want to make sure we had in a motion to approve um, and try try that. I mean, unless there's a strong feeling here that we really uh, need more testimony or, or uh, uh, input from uh, uh, technical experts or, or something like that, I suggest we explore the, the possibility of doing a, a motion tonight. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Let's, let's talk about possible conditions. Right. Um, I think we have also all acknowledged many of us have acknowledged that the, the height is not ideal, but that we do see it as meeting the letter of the law and being workable. Um, related to that, a condition I would be interested in seeing is DPW signing off on the stormwater yes. plan um, in light yeah. of this evidence. Um, I believe we should also include a condition regarding directional signage painted on the drive-through lane to um, 
for, for the, to get people to the teller window as well as show them where they're supposed to go to queue. Um, there were some minor yeah, recommendations. Note. There were some minor recommendations that the design review committee had proposed. Would we want to incorporate them or? I would, yes. Um, it's not signed off on by the applicant for the reasons that Alicia noted regarding the wording and wanting um, flexibility uh, around that. Um, Kevin, you're referring to the uh, tree issue. That's the only one I'm aware of that there's an issue. Is that what you're referring to? That's yes. what I'm referring to, yeah. Yes, it would be the uh, So the I think issue. what, what Alicia has referred to is, is language that's more consistent with exactly what was discussed at the design review meeting that we really want the opportunity to have an arborist advise on what's happened with those trees as opposed to just deciding in advance. And so that's- Oh, in that, in that case, would you be uh, amenable to a condition which would basically memorialize that approach that you would use an arborist to resolve the tree and, and let the, uh, 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 the zoning office uh, have a, uh, uh, you would certify what your, what your ultimate plan would be. Sign, sign off by, this, by the zoning office. We, we, want an arbor, we want an arborist involved in a decision. I don't think that we want to relinquish the decision of the owner for an arborist that's not associated with the project. Right. I, I'm, not so suggest, I'm, suggest, I'm suggesting we give you exactly what you're asking for. That easy. Um, so the recommendation as, it's, as, as made by the DRC is that applicant clarified that the two Norway maple trees in front of the building will be pruned to improve appearance and safety. I think we can keep that. We are going to do that anyway. The, then what it reads is, if at any point these trees are deemed to be in poor health and no longer an asset to the property, they may be replaced with historically correct species and with appropriate approval. Um, I think we should, so I think what, what you want to hear, and I hope someone can type this down because I can't write fast enough. Um, in consultation with an arborist, trees may be replaced if it becomes necessary, or it, in consultation with an arborist, trees may be replaced with historically correct species um, upon the, what am I trying to say again? Um, upon the arborist, you know, in consultation with an arborist, trees may be replaced as necessary with, with historically correct species. Right, we could say it's like, in consultation with an arborist, uh, the uh, Norway maple trees will either be rehabilitated or replaced uh, in such a way as to maintain the historical integrity of the, uh, of the structure. And I think you'd have to clarify that if, if the arborist decides that they're fine as they are, I, I think it needs to be the owner's decision really. No, he, yeah. said he said rehabilitated. Yes. Um, so I, th I think that kind of captures fine as they are. Do you, do you agree? You, Alicia, you have that language better what Pat, I think, wanted than what I'm referring to. I think we're going to no, kind of think, I, that. What um, Kate and Kevin were saying is if the arborist and the property owner feel it's in good health, then nothing needs to change. But should the arborist and the owner agree that they're in poor health and are a hazard, um, they need to be removed and then... Um, replaced at, at that time or in, in, in the future time. I think, I, think we're, I think we're on the same page. I think we're saying the I same thing. I think our, our words are about a third uh, as, as the ones we were just talking about there. I think we're trying to get to the same place, Alicia. Um, so okay. it's just a matter of making sure we do that. So, I guess I'd just like to add one thing. What if the arborist and the owner disagree? If the arborist believes they need to be taken down and the owner doesn't, I don't think that situation was covered. You're right, Joe. And in the original recommendation from the DRC, there is that little phrase, and with appropriate approval. Um, I don't know from whom that approval comes. Based on the DRCs, I, I, I wasn't at that meeting and I haven't read their minutes. Mike or anyone, do you know who that appropriate approval is supposed to come from? 
I don't know specifically. I do. I I know one of the concerns has been in the past that that if the trees were removed um, or a tree was removed, that they wanted the a tree to be replaced. And in the past, an issue has come up where the the tree was having problems, and somebody had talked about removing the tree, and there it was going to be removed and not replaced. And and the concern is you're either going to rehabilitate the trees. Um, and let them stay, but if they come down, then they've got to be replaced with a historically, you know, right. I don't think there's okay. much of a, of, a, of, of a care which decision happens, except right. not ending up in the position of having an unsafe tree or removing a tree and not replacing it. Those were the two things that the city wouldn't want to see happen. Okay, okay. I think we captured that. I think everyone's agreement that we'd want to make sure the trees are safe. That's, yeah. that's a low right. The other one is that if the trees are removed, there may be an opportunity to improve the landscaping to something different than what was there. And I think we want the right to look at that future uh -huh. design and perhaps present that with or without. And that's why we need the approval because um, Meredith indicated that because trees are part of a site plan, they need to still be removed, reviewed as changes occur because it's technically changing a site plan that was the um appropriate approval that's required yeah that would be a that right. would have to go back to get an approval if you were going to take the trees down and not replace them and come up with an alternative landscaping requirement then you'd have to come back and get a new approval for that okay so we've talked right. about <laughs> we've talked about replacement right yeah, we've talked about historically appropriate species. It doesn't say trees, so I think we're there. I think we're there as well. All right. Anything Are there else? other conditions? Uh, just looking at the staff report, there's, okay, so what, what are the section 3010 vehicle access and circulation requirements have met? I think we've decided they have, so we don't need to incorporate there. I think we're I think we're good to go. I, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure that the, the shutter hardware, the shutter optional shutter, still comes in from the um, DRC. We talked about the the trees. I just want to make sure the shutter still stayed in there. Thank you. Yes, we'd like to include that optional optional provision um, to put on historically appropriate shutters, preferably in a dark color. I think is what it said, or something like that. All right. We've talked about the conditions that um, have gone through the would be part of this motion. We've agreed that we have the evidence that we need to make a decision. We, for the record, many of us have expressed concern about the grade, um, but the stormwater approval we hope from D DPW is right. going to be a way to make sure that that is within the realm of acceptable. So, with that, I will entertain a motion. Okay, so I'll make the motion to approve the application uh, as submitted. Uh, with the uh, provision, additional provisions that uh, Department of Public Works will review and approve the stormwater uh, uh, final plan, um, that there will be directional signage uh, at the drive through, that, and here's the tricky one this is the trees, that uh, the recommendations of the DRC uh, shall be incorporated in the approval. And how do we want to address the, the final uh, part of that? We agree that, looking back on the note, so the wordsmithing we can still do even after we've done the vote, just as we for the decision. But okay. I think we should try to be as clear as possible. Every effort we made to maintain trees in a trees such that they are safe and healthy. An arbor the applicant will work with an arborist to determine if trees need to be removed maintained, removed, or replaced with historically appropriate species, and will seek appropriate approvals for any changes to the site plan resulting from this 
consultation. I, I just like to have the word historical removed from that because I think historically the trees that are there are historic, but the one arborist told us that they're an invasive species and not really the best tree for that location. I think Mike has so, that we should just have the opportunity to have a new submission on a new landscaping plan if we take the trees out. Okay, so it says historic species, which I think opens it up to a range of possibilities, and it needn't be the Norway maple um, okay. in particular. Um, and I think the word appropriate, historically appropriate, gives some that, room to ensure. Kate, I think that's fine. For example, yeah, lead, lead, yeah, lead, yeah. lead paint. Lead paint is historically appropriate, but we don't use lead paint anymore. Exactly. So, um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, is there anything else, or are we ready to vote? I'd like we to second it. Just a very minor, friendly amendment. You said directional signage for the drive through I'd like to change the word signage or sign to pavement markings. I don't think Thank there's you. any signs being put in. I, I accept, accept that. that amendment, Kevin? I accept that amendment. Very good. Okay. Is there additional discussion by board members? Did someone still need a second? We got to so. talk about the shutters too, right? Joe has seconded. Michael has raised oh. the issue of the shutters. Thank you. We wish to incorporate the design review committee's recommend uh, optional. Um, goodness, I'm on the wrong staff report. Um, the option to restore the shutters with the fix with the fixtures um, to historically uh, using historically appropriate shutters. Um, I'm going to defer the language in the staff report that's not in front of me right now, but we've discussed it, so I think we know what we're talking about. Um, as indicated in the application information, shutter hardware is present on almost all the windows and is deemed to be original to the building. Applicant has the option to install historically correct shutters back on the building, probably in black color, if so desired. That's what it is. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Um, do, Kevin and Joe, do you accept the amendment to incorporate this piece I just read about the shutters? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to call the roll. Uh, Joe? Yes. Rob? Abstain. Abstain. Okay, thank you. Roger? Yes. Um, Kevin? Yes. Michael? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Thank you. Um, you'll be hearing from the zoning office about next step. Um, everyone will re receive notice of the permit, including information about next steps that can be, be taken by any party who choose to do so. Um, all right. Thank you all very much for participating. We're at 1022, but I appreciate the work that's been done and the fact that it's concluded. Thank you for working together. Good conversation. Um, I already said that I appreciate it. I'll say it again. I do. Um, that brings us to our next item on the agenda, which is other business. Um, our next meeting is August 3rd. Um, at that meeting, uh, we will have a deliberative session. We will be in touch via email to determine, and, and we will uh, lay out the agenda for the public so that it is known when that deliberative session takes place, whether it's at the beginning or, or later on. And I would actually um, maybe turn to Mike and ask if you have advice on that. Um, how we should proceed with that on the August 3rd meeting. Uh, the, on the 3rd, there are only two agenda items, the continued meeting from tonight and the continued application from 99 East State, 99 East State, 100 East State? Your East State oh, 99. Yeah, so um, yeah, 99. So those you have two continued applications. I don't know if that other one is ready for deliberative session or if that one still has more input. Right. But um, okay, I would suggest that we can start with the East State Street application. And then that way, if we need to um, deliberate privately on that one, we can do both deliberations in the same batch. Does that work for others? Yes. Yeah. Which is the okay. Hey, Kate, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, which, which is the other? It's East State. Is that is that yeah. one from the? I must have missed that meeting. Is that what this is from? It, yeah, it's from last week. So if you want to participate in the um, 
in that meeting, I suggest uh, reviewing the meeting notes and all of the materials. It has to do with the creation of a dwelling unit on the parcel where, um, is it Primer that's located there? Primer Piper, Eggleston Kramer, or is it? Um, well, I'll tell you then. Yeah, it, so it's, um, please please check it out. Yeah, um, understood. Yeah. And um, that's, that's kind of reminded all of us that leading up to that meeting, please um, do review review the materials to maybe answer, you know, so the questions we may have coming out of this may be answered by further review of materials. Um, and that will help us all be prepared to work expediently in our deliberative session. Um, so okay. let's shut it down before we hit three and a half hours. Um, yes, let's we'll do our work. And thank you all. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Kate. So All right. Second. Second. Raise your hands if you say yes. <laughs> the motion to adjourn is unanimous. And Mike Miller, you can't vote, but I will see you later anyway. Thank you all. Good night. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Bye, Kate. Thanks for the great job. You all did. Thank you.